Okay, good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to the COVID-19 Research Synergies meeting. Uh, today, we are in session two, talking about ending COVID-19 therapeutics. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentations today. We had a very successful uh, session yesterday on uh, vaccines in terms of ending COVID-19. Uh, my name is Charu Kaushik, and I am the Institute Director for Infection and Immunity at Canadian Institutes of Health Research. I'm one of the GLOPIDAR co-chairs, uh, and I'm here to welcome you on behalf of GLOPIDAR uh, with my co-chair, uh, uh, Yazdin Yazdin Pana, who is the uh, Director of INSERM Reacting Program and the INSERM Institute of Infectious Disease, Microbiology and Immunology. So I'm gonna ask uh, Yazdin to give a quick overview of GLOPIDAR and then we'll get on with the session. Yazdin, over to you. Thanks, Cheru. So first of all, uh, uh, good afternoon, good morning uh, and good evening to everyone and thanks for joining this meeting. So I wanted to say just in two words, what is GLOPIDAR? Uh, GLOPITAR is an international network of research funding organizations. It was launched in 2013 to facilitate, accelerate, and deepen collaboration among research funders on emerging, on emerging diseases uh, by uh, strengthening global research preparedness between crises and also by mobilizing resources to respond rapidly and effectively to significant infectious diseases during crisis. Next slide. Uh, so on the next slide, you will see that currently uh, Globidar has 29 members and two observers. And of course, among the uh, members, South Africa and Brazil uh, from our uh, 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 chairs of the session. Next slide. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, uh, GLOPIDR was present uh, by members, uh, observers, and by its stakeholders that uh, were mobilized in the response. They collect information from mer members on existing research activities very early in the epidemic. They worked clo closely with WHO blueprint, uh, 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 and uh, in particular in February to set up uh, the roadmap and research priorities. And then uh, the members of GLOPIDAR launched emerging calls uh, uh, like uh, European Commission, of course, but also uh, UK uh, MRC or CEPI or Government of Canada or Wellcome Trust. And what, uh, since the beginning, uh, GLOPIDAR did was to coordinate funders to optimize the resource to try to avoid duplication and cover priorities. Uh, next slide. And just before I end, the idea was at that time, a few months later, now in July, to try to gather all those who were working on different topics, vaccines, social science, transmission, and therapeutics for them to converse, for them to talk to each other, to try to identify gaps. So I stop here. Uh, and I thanks again a lot to Charu, who did a lot, and all the organizing team. And today, Evelyn and uh, Claire uh, from European Commission and INSEM in particular. Thanks, Charu. You. Thank you, Yazdin. So uh, just a couple of housekeeping notes, just to make sure that the session runs smoothly. So uh, we are making, uh, asking all the participants, if you have any questions that you would like to be discussed or addressed to the panelists or speakers, please put that in the Q&A box, which is right next to the chat box. Uh, the chat box is available for you to discuss with each other or give comments, et cetera. But if you would like your questions to be picked up for discussion or questions, then please put it in the Q&A box, which will be monitored. Uh, the other part that I was going to remind everybody is that this, is, this session is being live streamed. Uh, so we would ask that everybody keep their cameras off unless you're speaking or you're part of a panel. Um, and uh, other than that, let's go ahead and have a good session. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our two co-chairs today, uh, Dr. Glenda Gray and Dr. Valdelia Veloso. 
Uh, Glenda is the president and CEO of the South African MRC, uh, and she is responsible for bringing together scientific evidence and experience to the Minister of Health and the, uh, and the National Coronavirus Command Council. Of course, many of us know Glenda from her other role, where in her, pers in her personal research space, she's a very well-known HIV researcher as well. Uh, and Dr. Valdelia uh, Veloso is the director of the National Institute of Infection at uh, Fio Cruz in Brazil. Uh, she's an infectious disease specialist and has served as an advisor to the Ministry of Health in Brazil, as well as on many other international bodies. Uh, so welcome Valdelia and Glenda. I'm going to hand over to Glenda, who's going to give you some overview slides. Um, thank you very much. On behalf of Valdelia and myself, we want to welcome you to this um, this session on therapeutic research. Therapeutic research is, is, is critical for the management of COVID-19. And we've seen, uh, particularly in South Africa, um, as, as we get more experience with um, the management of COVID-19 and as new research emerges, we see our death rates in our ICUs coming down. And in fact, um, from the beginning of the epidemic till now, introducing half-low nasal oxygen, nursing in prone, using IV dexamethasone, um, using half-flow nasal oxygen anticoagulants um, together with remdesivir and um, other, uh, other, other interventions. We are seeing our uh, intensivists managing COVID-19 much better and re reducing mortality, which is very important. And so the whole idea of um, therapeutic research is, the whole aim of therapeutic research is to reduce um, the mortality. So, you know, we, we will look at um, um, issues around antivirals. We will look, look at... Um, therapeutics to, to manage the storm, and, um, and there will be other discussions um, as well. So it's going to be very important to hear what kind of uh, research is happening and some of the cross-cutting themes that um, we are involved in. So you know at the moment, um, uh, both Brazil and South Africa are hard hit by, by um, the COVID epidemic. Um, in a, uh, globally, 13.8 million people um, have COVID and um, almost 600,000 people have died. In South Africa, around 325,000 people um, have, um, have COVID and our death rate is around 4,669. Various provinces in our country are peaking at different times. Our case fatality rate is around 1.5% and our reproductive rate um, uh, hovers between 1.1 and 1.5%, depending where you are um, in the country. Um, um, Valdeleo will, will, will We'll, we'll talk a little bit about the epidemic in Brazil in, in a few minutes, uh, but I just want to run through some logistical and organizational issues before she, she talks. Um, in terms of our, 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 our reports, each presentation will be about five minutes, so we ask all our presenters to respect time. Each presentation uh, will end, um, and, and people, there will be an opportunity to, to, to um, ask questions at, 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 at the, uh, during the question and answer. And um, we will be recording this session and it will be available on, um, on YouTube. There also will be a report um, that will be submitted and, um, and this report will go be made available um, on the GLOPID R website. So I'm going to hand over um, uh, to, to see some slides on the COVID epidemic in Brazil. Uh, thank you. Over to you. Adelaide. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, good evening. I would like to uh, thank the uh, organizer for inviting me to co-chair uh, this therapeutic session on COVID with my colleague, Grenda Gley. I will uh, briefly present some aspects of, of uh, COVID epidemic in Brazil. Next. So, we had the uh, identification in January 2020 of the uh, SARS-CoV-2, and the first, first case in Brazil was detected in February. Next. As you can see, from February to now, you can see how the epidemic is. Next. You can see here that, uh, as you know, Latin America is the new epicenter of the, the pandemic, with the 
Oh my. My 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 uh, screen. I um, if you go to the bottom left of your screen, um, you huh? may, and and if you go to the bottom left of your screen and you and you push your button, you might see um, at advance. There's a little left and right button. Have a look and see if it's there. Mm. I don't know what's happening here. Um, your next slide has come. So the next, you've got COVID-19 evolution worldwide. That's that's the next slide. Um, yeah, but uh, the, 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 uh, my problem is that I, I'm not seeing it in a uh, large screen, but okay. Okay. Uh, so in this uh, this slide, you can see you can see the COVID-19 evolution worldwide, and the new confirmed deaths per leading country. You can see that Brazil is high, 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 and uh, it's something that is terrible for us. We are facing uh, many uh, problems here. That uh, they are problems related to. Uh, the health system that we don't uh, don't have enough uh, intensive care beds, respirators, and but our major problem is the political uh, environment that is totally disruptive with uh, um, messages going to the population that are totally against the science and totally against the life because. Uh, yeah, this confusion is taking people to don't do social distance and people are getting infected and we have already, we are almost, we have now almost 80,000 deaths in Brazil. Next, please. You can see here the cases in, at the left and the deaths in the uh, right. And you can see that the most of the, the highest um, um, mortality rate, number of deaths are in the north and the northeast. Next. Next, okay. So in this uh, slide, you can see that ethnic and regional variation in hospital mortality from COVID-19 in Brazil, a cross-sectional observation study that was published in uh, Lancet, Lancet Global Health. You, uh, in the right, you can see that uh, the oldest and, and those that are uh, uh, black and mixed uh, race are, the, uh, are those that are having the highest risk of mortality. And also uh, people with comorbidity. This is, in the right you can see the mortality stratified by uh, geographic region. And we can see here uh, Northeast in, uh, in north of Brazil with being uh, most, most affected. Next. Here, here we have uh, data from a study that uh, uh, are being conducted in waves in Brazil. It's a seroprevalence study, population-based. And you can see that also here, uh, the north, northeast, are much more affected than the uh, South East, Central East, and South. When you see it uh, in the right, you see that it's clear that there is a social uh, gradient on uh, 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 zero prevalence. You can see here that the uh, gray bars are the poorest. And, and you see that 
we are when we take into consideration the uh, the waves. Also, you can see on race color that black mixed and indigenous are the most affected. Next. Healthcare professionals are those being hardly affected. You can see physicians, nurses, nurse technicians, and other healthcare workers, the prevalence is very high. As you can see, physicians, 12%. When you see nurses, technicians, there are, that is uh, high, high school level, we go to 35%. Here we have a, a pictures and some data about the uh, how uh, the epidemic is hitting Brazil and the our problems highlighted here. We have a, a high number of people living in uh, conditions where social distance and hand washing washing are virtually impossible. We have the 13 million people living in favelas. Latin America has one of the most overcrowded prison worldwide. And competing epidemics, dengue for instance. Denial of the severity of the pandemic by political leaders, maybe it's our major problem. They prioritize the economic recover instead of the health of the population. We also face short, shortage of uh, uh, PPE and ventilators, intensi intensive care. Our system is, in, in, it's, uh, is overloaded with uh, COVID uh, severe cases and many, many people are dying because of, we don't have enough beds and also because people are coming late to the health services. Next, please. Oh, I forgot. To... <laughs> so here, it's what I, I have just uh, said. Oh, uh, the favelas, uh, the shortage of PPE, intensive uh, care beds, and our political problems. Next. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Valde Vadeleu. Um, if you can um, um, into, um, introduce the next speaker for us, um, it's going to be uh, um, um, very important to hear um, and how Brazil and South Africa can make use of all these um, therapeutic research going forward. So, uh, it's, it's your job to introduce Beatrice, yeah. Yes, yes, it's my uh, great, just a minute. It's my great pleasure to introduce Beatrice Greenstein. She's from, uh, uh, in, in, Infectious Disease at uh, Fiocruz Brazil. Beatriz is the director of the SCG AIDS Clinical Research Laboratory at the National Institute of Infectious Disease at Oswaldo Cruz Foundation. And she is the principal investigator of the Fiocruz HIV AIDS Clinical Trials Unit that is affiliated to the NIH funded HIV Prevention Trials Network the AIDS Clinical Trials Group, and the Coronavirus Prevention Trials Network. She uh, is also uh, working with the Caribbean, Central America, and South America Longitudinal Database Study Network, as well as to the INRS. She is the co-chair of the HPTN 
OH3 study. She is a member of the Ministry of Health HIV Treatment Advisory Group, as well as the PrEP Exposure Prophylaxis Advisory Group. She is the co-chair for the Latin America, the Ensemble Trial, a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled phase three study to assess the efficacy and safety of uh, adenovirus 26 cov one for prevention of SARS-CoV-2 mediated COVID-19 in, out, in uh, adults aged 18 years and older. Beatrice, please. Can you hear me? Yes, thanks, Beatrice. So good morning, everyone. Good evening or good afternoon, depending on where we are, you are. Thank you uh, very much to the organizers for inviting me to this important meeting. Today, I will very briefly present you uh, two of the trials we are conducting at the Evandro Chagas National Institute of Infectious Diseases at Fiocruz. The first is the adaptive platform treatment trial for outpatients with COVID-19, which is a multi-center trial of the AIDS clinical trial group, trials group and the accelerating COVID-19 therapeutic intervention and vaccines active partnership, adapt, the ADAPT out COVID trial active 2 slash A5401. This is sponsored by the NIAID, NIH. And the second one is the phase three randomized double-blind multicenter study to evaluate the efficacy and safety of remdesivir plus tocilizumab compared with remdesivir plus placebo in hospitalized patients with severe COVID-19. And this one is sponsored by Roche. Next one, please. There is an urgent need for a platform to rapidly evaluate therapies in the outpatient setting to prevent disease progression and reduce serious complication of COVID-19 transmission. The ADAPT OUT COVID trial active 2A45 a5401 is a master protocol to evaluate the safety and efficacy of investigational agents for the treatment of symptomatic non-hospitalized adults with COVID-19. Next one. The agent selection is prioritized in conjunction with a active based on several parameters, such as activity against SARS-CoV-2, uh, phase one PK and safety data, and the potential to expand to phase three. The first proposed agent is a monoclonal antibody from Lilly. That is, and, and the product is derived from persons who recovered from COVID-19. When two or more new agents are being tested concurrently, the same placebo will be used if, feas if feasible. Next one, please. So the ADAPT OUT COVID trial active 25401 is a randomized blinded controlled adaptive platform that allows agents to be added and dropped during the course of the study for efficient testing of new agents against placebo within the same trial infrastructure. It begins with a phase two evaluation, followed by a transition into a larger phase three evaluation. And this will allow for comparison of multiple therapies with a common com control group, continuous introduction of new promising agents as they become available, and generation of separate effect size estimates for each therapy. Next one. For either phase two or three participants, we undergo two randomizations. Next one, and just a second. The phase three evaluation is a continuation of the phase two trials for agents that uh, proved that could go into phase three, or an agent may also enter directly into phase three. Next one. Just to remind you, this is a study for ambulatory patients. Next, next one. 
the phase two primary objective is to determine efficacy of an agent to safely reduce the duration of COVID-19 symptoms and viral shedding through 28 days after study entry. Next one, please. The sample size is 110 per agent and 110 concurrent on placebo. Next one, please. The primary objective of phase three now is to determine if an agent will prevent the composite endpoint of either hospitalization or death by 28 week days after study entry. Next one, please. And in the phase three, the sample size is 1,000 persons per agent and 1,000 concurrent on placebo. Next one, please. I will now move to the second clinical trial, which is a phase three randomized double-blind multicenter study to evaluate the efficacy and safety of remdesivir plus tocilizumab compared with remdesivir plus placebo in hospitalized patients with severe, uh, severe COVID-19 pneumonia. Next one, please. The primary objective is to evaluate the efficacy of the combination of rendemsevir plus tocilizumab arm compared with the rendemsevir plus placebo arm for the treatment of severe COVID-19 pneumonia and with several endpoints to evaluate as you can see here. Next one. The study also has several secondary objectives. Next one. The safety objective for the study is to evaluate safety of the combination of remdesivir plus, plus tocilizumab compared with remdesivir plus placebo for the treatment of severe COVID-19, again with several endpoints. We also have a pharmacokinetic objective for the study that is to characterize the PK profile of uh, remdesivir and metabolites in patients with severe COVID-19. Next slide. Also, several biomarker objectives for the study uh, to evaluate the predictive response to remdesivir plus tocilizumab treat treatment. Next one, please. Just a comment here that tuberculosis still represents an important public public health problem in resource-limited settings. And so, in our countries, it's even more important and to rule out TB before enrolling patients on trials with tocilizumab. That is, uh, TB is an important exclusion criteria because these drugs can uh, reactivate tuberculosis in patients who were infected by uh, TB. Next one, please. The study will be conducted in North America, Europe, and Brazil, and the total sample size is 450. Next one, please. So just to show you that this is a brand new uh, internal uh, care uh, that play a hospital that just dedicated to COVID-19 that was recently opened at Fiocruz. It has 195 individual hospital rooms, 130 of them intensive care, very well equip equipped. And so we are able to really provide uh, very sophisticated care for uh, severely uh, ill patients with COVID-19. Next one. Next one. I want to thank you very much for your attention. Beatrice, thank you so much. Um, such a pleasure to hear the work that you're doing and, and, and it's wonderful. So we're gonna go on to the next um, presentation. Just remember to keep all your questions coming so that we can have a question and answer at the end. So it's my um, pleasure to in introduce Dr. Doi and he is from, um, he studied in, in Japan and he, he trained in infectious diseases he spent a lot of time working on um, characterization of novel antimicrobial resistant mechanisms in gram negative bacteria. Um, he moved to the States to, prefer, to pursue further training um, and he, he, he worked um, at the University of Pittsburgh as an infectious disease fellow. So he's been involved also in clinical and translational research and um, he then moved on to become an associate professor at Pittsburgh um, and then as a full professor of microbiology and infectious diseases at Fujita Health University since 2017. 
He directs active research laboratories at both institutions and has led the COVID-19 response at Fujita Health University, which has now cared for over 160 patients, including passengers and crew from the cruise ship, the Diamond Princess. So he's gonna uh, um, be the next person. Thank you. It is very nice. I'm very excited to hear about Flavie Privo because we also are looking at it in South Africa. Thanks, Glenda, and um, hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to uh, report on the top line results of a, a small trial on favipiravir that we just uh, recently completed um, in Japan. So next slide, please. So favipiravir is an oral inhibitor of viral, of viral RNA polymerase, which was developed in Japan. It's currently approved in Japan for the treatment of new or emerging influenza infection. Um, there's some in vitro data, but efficacy against COVID-19 remains unclear due to um, a lack of uh, RCTs so far. Next slide, please. So um, here's the, uh, our study design in one slide. We sought to determine the efficacy of favipiravir in reducing viral load among patients with asymptomatic or mild COVID-19 in an open label randomized active control trial. Uh, we had 89 pa uh, patients who were randomized to early treatment arm and delayed treatment arm. And the dosing regimen was favipiravir, 1800 milligrams times two on the first day, which is a loading dose, followed by 800 milligrams BID. So this is about um, uh, twice uh, as much as what's approved for um, a treatment of influenza. Uh, below is the, the scheme. Uh, so early treatment group got 10 days uh, starting on day one delayed group, uh, treatment group uh, started treatment on day six. So we were able to uh, make a head-to-head -head comparison between day one and day six. Uh, obviously the, the shortcoming is that uh, we can't tell much from the data after day six. The next slide, please. So here's the uh, flow chart. We randomized 89 patients, um, evenly randomized to the two treatment arms, uh, which is good. But uh, one uh, sort of unexpected issue that we encountered was almost 20% of the patients who was um, enrolled based on laboratory confirmation um, earlier uh, already had negative PCR on, on day one, um, which, was, uh, which we found out later uh, on, uh, I mean, after the patients were, were discharged. Um, next slide, please. Okay. So the demographics of the group were generally, uh, were generally balanced, except for six, which was a little bit uh, uh, imbalanced. Mean age was 51.7 um, years old. Time from diagnostic PCR was 3.9 days. Time from first day of fever uh, for those who had fever was 7.5 days. None of the 189 patients had progressive disease or death um, during the 28-day uh, follow-up period. Next slide, please. Um, is the, the primary endpoint was um, achievement of negative PCR by day six. Uh, we had only 69 evaluable patients uh, for the aforementioned reason. And adjusted hazard ratio for PCR negativity by day six um, in the um, early tra treatment group, uh, opposed to delayed treatment group, which was a no drug at the time, uh, was 1.416. And uh, I have the kaplan meyer curve uh, to, the, to the right but uh, we, we didn't uh, hit statistical significance. Next slide, please. Um, uh, one of the second range points I'm showing here is 50% 50, 50 log reduction in viral load by day six, um, trying to make it a little bit more sensitive than um, negative PCR. We had 69 available patients, as I mentioned, and the uh, OS ratio for 50% log reduction in viral load was 4.75 um, with a p-value shown there. Next slide, please. Uh, we had several clinical exploratory endpoints. Um, the one I'm showing here is time to differ vessels among uh, just 30 patients who actually had uh, fever on, uh, upon enrollment. And uh, uh, the hazard ratio for differ vessels um, by day six was 1.880, which is, uh, I think, a pretty reasonable uh, hazard ratio, but uh, we didn't. Um, Again, we didn't uh, have um, a significant p-value here. And you can see the Kaplan-Meier curve here. In general, there was about one day reduction in the, in the duration of fever 
in the um, early treatment group. Next slide, please. Um, here are the common adverse uh, events that we observed. Um, hyperuricemia or increased uric acid level was uh, seen in 84% of the patients, which is um, quite higher compared with uh, what has been reported for a flu dose, which is about half of what, uh, what our patients got. Uh, the others were um, subclinical uh, laboratory uh, abnormalities in the liver function um, enzymes. And uh, these values normalized in most patients after a completion of the treatment. Next slide, please. So to wrap it up, in this open-label randomized trial of 89 asymptomatic to mild COVID-19 patients, early treatment with favipiravir was associated with it with higher rates of viral clearance and early defervescence, but they did not reach statistical significance. And uh, hyperuricemia was the most common adverse event, which uh, resolved after therapy in, in most of our patients. And, and these numbers are in the in an English press release that uh, we posted uh, yesterday on our, our university website. So I'll stop here and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Adelaide, are you on? Um, are you there? You can introduce the next speaker. Yes, I, I, uh, I'm here. So uh, I would like to uh, invite Andrea Vicari, Dr. That's a pharmaceutic uh, in Italy. Andrea Beccari currently is the responsible for the business unit R&D platforms and services of Dompte Pharmaceutic. She is the coordinator of the Excalate project and associated research of the National Research Council of Italy. Andrea. Please. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. First of all, thanks for the kind invitation. Next slide, please. Here I want to introduce uh, the Escalate for COVID consortium. It's composed by 18 partners spread them. Um, in Europe, uh, it involves more than 200 uh, EU researchers in, uh, in the project. Next slide, please. The consortium is meant to be a fully integrated platform uh, from uh, the design, uh, selection, uh, testing uh, in uh, vitro in vivo models up to the design of a clinical trials of the identified compounds. And this is organized in six task forces and in 10 working package. Next slide, please. So we decide to focus our attention and, and the important effort on computerized drug design just because uh, in the first part uh, of the pandemic crisis, that is uh, the, at least the, the, the first uh, three months, uh, there are no molecule that, that can come from uh, experiment and wet lab. Once because we need several months to develop uh, phenotypic assay and biochemical assay. So if we want to find molecules that are not already labeled as uh, antiviral, we have to rely from one side of experiments and to the other side to computer simulation. We already, after several months of infection, we had a, a very important uh, medical need, uh, especially because the best molecule, uh, that is the remdesivir, at the moment uh, is only active on a fraction of the population, uh, around 30%, uh, due to the fact that uh, do not distribute uh, correctly in the lungs. So computer simulation are able to analyze the protein of the virus uh, just before uh, the experiments can take place uh, in, uh, in vitro and in vivo and propose molecules with different mechanism of action in the very early, early, very early phase of the project. Next slide, please. With our approach, we are able to identify five out of 
25 uh, molecules that are active uh, in the phenotypic assay, assay uh, we perform and on the, uh, living virus uh, on the vero cell uh, at the university on, on Leuven in Belgium. Out of the screening of uh, more than 7,000 drugs uh, already on the market uh, or uh, in the clinical trials. Next slide, please. So I'm here to present the very first result of our consortium in terms of molecules that could be used in, in the COVID pandemic that is the raloxifen. So we combine different approach in silico from the computer simulation interaction with the raloxifen with multiple targets of the SARS-CoV-2, and then we combine the information from uh, system pharmacology and disease modeling of the pathology and the information already known in the literature on the effect of selective estrogen receptor modulator that by the mechanism action on the host in our, in our um, analysis, uh, combined with uh, the direct activity of raloxifene on the virus, uh, make the raloxifene a good candidate. Then we were able to validate the experimental results, finding the raloxifene active in our phenotypic assay, and at the same time by other groups uh, have been identified as, a potential, as an inhibitor of the ACE2 spike protein-protein interaction. On these findings, we design a clinical trials of uh, in, uh, that we performed in Europe uh, and we will start uh, in, uh, in September. Next slide. So thank you very much for your time and for the invitation. Thank you very much. Uh, just to remind um, uh, the speakers, there is a, um, a question function and um, maybe we can answer some of the questions um, while, we, while we're going on to give us some more time in case we need to make up. Beatrice, there's a question for you around tocilizumide and uh, latent TB. Tocilizumab, sorry, uh, and latent TB, if you could just maybe answer that and just keep looking at the, the question bars. So it's my great pleasure to um, introduce Anna Lina Spetz from Stockholm University. She's an, a professor in, in immunology and she um, has previous experience um, in various universities and she's the founder of Cell and Gene Therapy Company, Avaris AB and is now the, the founder and CEO of Tarmed Pharma AB. She's an immunologist with an MD background, and she specializes in defenses against virus infections. And she's bringing um, a novel antiviral compound to the, to the project, building on many years of experience, um, and we look very forward to hearing what she's got to say. So thank you, Anna, Annalina. Okay, so thank you for the invitation. So I'm here to present uh, the Fighting COVID project, which is an EU-funded project. And we have three main aims. And the first aim was to establish various in vitro assays, pseudotype assays against the SARS-CoV-2, which has been done. And we are using different uh, cell lines and also primary cells that has been set up. And then the second aim was to establish SARS-CoV-2 macaque challenge models, which has also been done. Uh, and these two, um, and platforms are then available and we are open for collaborations with others. And then the part of the project is that we were three independent groups that went together and we have been working with different broad spectrum antivirals to be giving intranasal. So next slide, please. So this is our consortium. So at the Stock University, we bring to the project one broad spectrum antiviral. So we have a efficacy in vitro against many different types of viruses. And we also have in vivo data against influenza and RSV so far. And then from Denmark, Alexander Selikin, he's bringing a polymer. And they also have broad spectrum antiviral activity, including other coronaviruses as well. And then the third group is uh, Thomas Rader, and he's bringing molecular tweezers that can interact with the envelope of viruses and then destroy the viruses. And uh, they're also de now developing in second generations and they're now in, 
we have efficacy in the nanomolar range. So these uh, our three groups were brought together through our common collaborator Jan Münch, who is then establishing uh, high throughput in vitro screening assays and also studies in, in primary human epithelial cells, for example. So at the moment we are doing preclinical toxicity studies uh, by the intranasal route, and that is uh, CRO in Stockholm at Lego. And then the aim is now in the fall to start testing our antivirals in the macaque challenge model. And this has been done with Rochelle Legrand's team in France. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the, when we talk about broad spectrum antivirals, many people started thinking, well, that can't be very specific. Well, the thing is that we want to have very potent antivirals in the nonomolar range. But why they are broad spectrum is because of their mechanism of action. So many of them can, uh, the ones we are working on is an oligo and the polymers, they target entry mechanisms. Uh, certain endocytic pathways common to several different types of viruses. That's why they can be broad spectrum, although the interaction with the molecules on the cell um, surface is very specific. And then the polymer and the tweezer are, can then interact also with the viral envelope directly. And then the oligonucleotide that we are working with can also modulate innate immune responses. We can detect increased expression of ICs, for example, in vivo. Next slide, please. So this is an example of, of publications that are out there and uh, on our homepage, you are most welcome to look at them. Uh, just to see that John Minch group has been very productive in establishing all these in vitro assays. And Rochelle Grant's group has set up uh, the, the macaque challenge model. And of course, in our group, we're also working with um, repurposing drugs. So the first drug that Rochelle Grant tested uh, was hydroxychloroquine, for example. And uh, John Minch have also now identified, uh, for example, the alpha-1 antitrypsin inhibitors in, in, have potent activity in vitro. Next slide, please. So this is just to show an example uh, of data from the from a pseudotype SARS-CoV assay established by John Minch, um, showing here now they have identified the alpha-1 antitrypsin inhibitor, which is potent in vitro. Uh, next slide, please. And here is data from Rochelle Grant's group uh, setting up the macaque challenge model. And as many groups have seen before working in macaques is that the monkeys, they do get infected, but uh, the, they, um, the majority, almost all actually clear infection, they get relatively mild disease. Uh, you can identify lesions in the lungs by CT scans, which are typical for, for COVID. Uh, but they also clear the infections by day eight or so. And in these uh, experiments with hydrochloroquine, using either high or low dose, even doing pre-exposure uh, pre prophylaxis, unfortunately, there was no significant effect in this macaque model by hydroxychloroquine. So next slide, please. So the key message is that we have set up the in vitro and in vivo models. And we are now conducting some preclinical safety analysis of our new type of uh, antivirals. And we start the macaques in the fall. Um, so the idea with our antivirals is that, well, uh, even though we really hope now that vaccines will be much, much faster than the development of, of our new antivirals, but the idea is that we would like to continue to develop these antivirals because we also have efficacy against other viruses like RSV, influenza, Ebola, and so forth. So if we could have these type of antivirals ready on the shelf to be able to be used early on in case there is a new outbreak of a new virus, uh, this could be helpful to contain an epidemic early. This is our vision, uh, why we think it's really useful to develop this type of new type of antivirals. So thank you for your attention. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, Sandra Leia? Yeah. Uh, now, uh, Suzanne Harold will uh, present. Suzanne Harold uh, is MD, PhD, is a full professor for pulmonary infections and chief of the sections of infectious disease, including the COVID-19 unit at the University of Hospital, Germany, University of Giessen and Marburg Lung Center. She is board certified in pulmonary medicine and infectious disease and coordinates a research consortium called Virus-Induced Lung Injury, Pathobiology and Novel Therapeutic Strategies funded by German Research Foundation that has focus on respiratory virus, including coronavirus, for several years. She will present on translating preclinical pre experimental data into clinical trials during the pandemic. Suzanne, please. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. Can you, can you give me the next slide? Okay, so I'm, I'm talking about um, house-based strategies to fight um, SARS coronavirus 2, and we are focusing on a cytokine or growth factor that is called granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor or GMCSF. And GMCSF has already been approved um, to mobilize granulocytes in neutropenic patients and it's applied intravenously or, or subcutaneously. So what it does actually, it's, it's very well known to drive myeloid cell differentiation from the bone marrow um, and also in the circulation like granulocytes and macrophages and particularly relevant um, is its effect on host defense activation of pulmonary macrophages. Um, and we and others have identified that, that this is not the only um, thing that GMCSF does, but it also drives epithelial stem cell proliferation and differentiation in the lung. And this likely drives re-establishment of the lung barrier after severe um, viral or bacterial injury. So next slide, please. Um, what we did was we, this is a model of influenza infection or influenza pneumonia and severe ARDS in mice. So what we did, we took mice that lack GMCSF and if we take a low dose of influenza, all these mice die from the infection and the wild type mice all survive and vice versa if we increase the virus dose and we use mice that overexpress GMCSF in the lung. Um, and have high levels of GMCSF in the lung lining fluid, then uh, most of these mice survive, whereas all the wild type mice die. So clearly GMCSF increases survival in viral pneumonia and um, pneumonia induced ARDS. Next slide. We also um, put recombinant GMCSF intratracheally into the lungs of mice that have been infected with different types of viruses. And this reduces the viral load in the lavage fluid and it substantially decreases lung injury as shown by different lung injury parameters at the bottom of this slide, including arterial blood gases. So it significantly improves oxygenation and gas exchange. And this is what you want to achieve in your patients. Next slide. Um, we also applied a model of lung organoids, and these are small organoids that are derived from lung stem cells. And in red, you see these are type 2 alveolar uh, uh, epithelial cells. And uh, in these organoids that lack GMCSF signaling, um, you cannot establish or re-establish uh, the epithelial barrier as shown here in red in, in the right uh, side of the slide. So this also happens in vivo, and I cannot show the data due to the lack of time, um, but GMCSF is really relevant in uh, regenerating the injured lung and re-establishing barrier function. So together with this um, function on the epithelial repair and the host defense uh, of macrophages and dendritic cells, and this is summarized in the next slide, as you can see, um, this summarizes all the beneficial functions of GMCSF with respect to epithelial barrier repair, host defense, and local expansion of dendritic cells in an uh, influenza virus infection model. I could not show this data due to the lack of time. Um, due to all these beneficial effects in the lung, we actually decided to go for a um, first in man approach. Next slide. So what we did was we had patients with severe pneumonia-associated ARDS inhaled uh, GMCSF as a compassionate treatment. And these patients were on the normal, usual therapy, antibiotics, fluid restriction, and lung protective ventilation, and some even were on ECMO. 
And then um, next slide. Um, we uh, were supported by a large um, uh, biobank that is, is established at the German Lung Center um, at the University of Gießen, where we had a lot of samples stored of these patients, including BAL samples. And next slide. Um, and this is combined to a large data warehouse where phenotypic data of these patients, including an ARDS cohort, um, a national cohort is stored. And we were able to analyze these patients. And next slide. Um, in, in the bad side to bench approach, this uh, is what I wanted to highlight here. Next slide. Um, and what we found was that GMCSF indeed activates uh, lung macrophages in these uh, ICU patients. That, that is data from six patients and it improved oxygenation compared to untreated and it reduced morbidity scores like subscores. These are classical ICU morbidity scores. Next slide. So we uh, actually implemented a trial that is called GI HOPE, um, GMCSF inhalation to improve host defense and pulmonary barrier restoration. This was already running upon start of the pandemic. And then we expanded it to COVID-19 and included also these uh, patients that had COVID ARDS. And the endpoints are listed there. This is a therapeutic approach to treat ARDS in COVID patients. And it's funded by the Ministry of Education and Research. And in parallel, we um, also implemented the GI COVID trial, GMCSF inhalation to prevent RDS in COVID-19 pneumonia, which is more preemptive to prevent RDS in patients that have COVID-19 pneumonia. And the primary endpoint is to, um, uh, to, to check for the need of mechanical ventilation in a 15-day period. And it's also funded um, by, the, by the German ministry. It's both randomized double-blind placebo-controlled multi-center investigator initiated trials. One is a phase two, one is a phase three trial. Um, and uh, it's all about inhaled um, GMCSF in these patients. Next slide. So this is my summary slide. And, and I think this is what I want to point out. Um, what are key elements and infrastructures needed and relevant to enforce translation from basic science into the clinics? And I think highly relevant is a basic biomedical research environment to drive the discovery engine. And, and you need a consortium in place with all the preclinical in vitro and in vivo disease models, as already uh, pointed out in the previous presentation. It's um, always helpful to use a repurposing approach as frequently done during this pandemic because phase one can be rap rapidly accomplished for new application routes, for example, like here with inhalation, and we need collaborations with industry here. Then I think what is also very important is a mindset for translation in place at the universities, but also at national level to um, have the translational pipeline already implemented and a, 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 let's say a local culture of building private public, public, public partnerships that need to be established. Then we need hubs or institutions in place to take care for patenting and technology transfer issues. We need clinician scientists that are not only taking care for patients, but combine clinical work and basic science for better understanding of pathomechanisms. Um, also very helpful was biobanking and data warehouse structure, as already mentioned, for the bedside to bench approach. And this allows for better um, precision phenotyping and therefore for better protocol design and readout definition in the design of, of the clinical trial protocols. And then, of course, finally, national and local clinical trials infrastructures that support funding rapidly, as done by the BMBF and also um, university clinical trial units, um, as we already had in place, to, uh, for the study design protocol submission and, and also for the trial management to have it fast uh, during such a pandemic. Now, this um, is my very last slide. Next one. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we're going on to the next session, which is towards new options for treatment. Is Steve Webb, are you here, Steve? We can't see you. Um, if, uh, is he here? Yeah. Steve, are you here? Just say yes. Um, does he, is he not here? So, uh, so should we move on to the next one? Um, if Steve Webb is not here, I'm going to move on to um, the next um, uh, person until he comes back on and we'll introduce Amato Reish Rihon from the University of Paris, um, France. Um, thank you. You can introduce yourself, Amato. Thank you very much. 
Okay, th thank you. Do you hear me? Is it okay? Yeah. Yes? We hear you perfectly. Thank okay, you. So, okay. So I'm going to present you the, 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 Croy, Mini, uh, the Croy Mini study. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, um, you all know uh, the, the COVID crisis uh, background. So uh, just a brief summary. And um, in March, uh, we faced uh, in France uh, some uh, difficulties in designing uh, air cities. Uh, it was difficult because we have a lot of uh, dis dis disorganization of our usual research structure, lack of ability of clinician, lack of uh, immediate funding, a multiple, uh, uh, a lot of candidate drugs to test, a poor knowledge of the natural history of, uh, of, the, of the disease, and, and, and moreover, a core outcome set which was not very clear uh, at that time. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, then we decide to focus uh, our study on some points. Um, and first of all, we tried, we decide to find an effective treatment or to try to find an effective treatment beside antiviral uh, uh, therapy and especially on uh, immunomodulator. Uh, modu we try to test multiple treatment uh, uh, candidates already approved in France for other condition. We decided we wanted to complete trial within the next six weeks to have a, a, a quick answer and to perform this trial within, without increasing too much the workload, the workload of, uh, of, of our hospitals. And from, finally, we wanted to, to, to find clinically relevant uh, treatment effect. Uh, I mean, not huge, but, but large treatment effects are not too, 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 too small. Uh, next slide, please. Thus, uh, uh, to 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 um, for, uh, for for that, we decided uh, uh, we choose we we chose a, a very special design. We decide to keep to to embed several RCTs with within the same uh, uh, large cohort study. And the key feature of this cohort study was. Uh, a, a large recruitment uh, of patients, a regular measurement of, measurement of the outcome for, for all the patients within the, the cohorts, and within the cohort, the capacity to, to randomize the patient within several uh, uh, randomized clinical, uh, clinical uh, trials. Next uh, slide, please. We, we, we made with uh, several very specific methodological choice. First, we decide not to have placebo. And the reason was that in France, it was impossible at that time to obtain a real placebo in such a, a short, a shorter time. We decided also not to have a shared control group because we suspected that the standard of care may change over the time and we, want, we wanted to be able to to compare the new treatment or the immunomodulator treatment to the standard of care at, at any time. We choose two primary outcomes based on the, uh, on, the, on the scale proposed by the WHO at day four on day uh, 14, and the choice of D4 was to be able to have a quick answer. And finally, we stay in a, uh, in a Bayesian approach and the reason was to be able to, to have a very adaptive uh, uh, trial. We, would, we wanted to be able to drop harms, to add new trials, to, to be able to include more patients uh, within uh, first trials. So the Bayesian uh, 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 framework was, was, I, uh, was a good choice for, 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 for that. Next uh, slide. This is the scheme of our study. So you ha we have a, 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 a big cohort, we call the cohort, the core immuno uh, study. And within the cohort, we stratified two types of patients. One, uh, well, one strata was ICU patient, and the second strata was non-ICU uh, patient. And for uh, each strata, we, 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 we have several trials. The trials could be sequential, 
sequential or they could be in parallel but the main uh, the main uh, characteristic of the trial was that uh, uh, according to the first results or according to uh, external uh, information we wanted to be able to modify the, st the standard of, of care for the next for, for the next uh, uh, trial uh, next slide please we wanted also to have a very uh, decentralized organization because all the, the, the clinical trial units were overloaded by, by, uh, by COVID uh, uh, trial. So we decided to, 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 to decentralize the management of the, of the study within each hospital and it was easier to manage the overall uh, uh, trials. Next slide. This is the two, the description of the two strata. So basically we have patient not requiring ICU and, and patient requiring uh, ICU. And the outcome were for the first strata, the survival without need for ventilation. And for the second strata, patient requiring ICU, the cumulative incidence of success, successful uh, tracheal, uh, tracheal extubation. Next slide. So uh, we completed, uh, we already completed four trials, one comparing sarilumab to standard of care, one tocilizumab to standard of care, and one anakinra to standard of care. The VIRO study was stopped by, by the DSMB. We have two more studies ongoing, one uh, uh, on plasma and one on uh, eculizumab. And we should uh, begin a new study in, uh, um, uh, we should begin the uh, study next Monday, uh, comparing the, the tocilizumab plus dexamethasone and the dexamethasone, because the, our new standard of care is now the dexamethasone due to the recent publication uh, in UK. Uh, next slide. We have now uh, 800 patients included in the, in the, in the trial, um, uh, and I hope to be able to very soon to communicate uh, the, resulti, the results of the, of the, of the three first uh, trials. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. I think we found, um, we found, uh, we found Steve. Steve, are you here? Are you here now? Okay, cool. Are you going to start? Thank you, uh, Glenda. Here, here uh, I, I am having a problem with my, my video. I have a message that I can't start my, my video. Okay, so Steve, you can go quickly. Steve, are you able Thanks. to, um, can you see? Okay, thanks. We'll, we'll let Steve go, Olivia, and then you can, Val, Valdelea, and then you can introduce the next person. Thank, thank you, Glenda. Um, and I'll welcome everyone uh, from my own time zone. Uh, so uh, good evening, um, and many thanks to the organizers uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I'm a clinician, I'm an intensive care specialist. Um, and what's uh, most important to clinicians and public health authorities is understanding what treatments uh, work uh, to save lives. Uh, please just click through the, um, the animations uh, that are there. Um, but um, clinician, it's extremely unlikely that um, any form of monotherapy is ever going to represent um, a complete solution for COVID-19. There's an array of treatment options, antivirals, antiviral combinations, corticosteroids, targeted immune modulation, anticoagulation and antiplatelagents, neutralizing antibodies. And so what is important for clinicians is understanding the effect of treatment combinations because that is what they provide at the bedside. And important to appreciate that it's plausible that combinations of even treatments that are effective in isolation offer no additional value versus the possibility of a synergistic effect or even uh, the possibility of antagonistic effect can't be excluded. And simple A versus B trials will not reveal those um, uh, contingent relationships. And obviously what is needed in a time critical uh, public health emergency um, is that information uh, as soon as possible. And next slide, uh, thank you. Um, I, I'm involved in the REMAP CAP um, uh, clinical trial program. And I think it's important that we just run through some of the challenges 
uh, that we've identified uh, in the last five months. So the first I've already alluded to, it's the large array of possible treatments with the need to understand treatment-treatment interactions, as well as treatment by stage of illness interactions. And already the information that's available with respect to dexamethasone suggests that there is a treatment by stage of illness interaction, with dexamethasone effective in more severely ill patients, but probably not effective, possibly harmful in less uh, ill patients. And it's also important to consider the possibility of what might be referred to as treatment by setting interactions, where treatments that work in some resource level area, areas are not effective uh, in other. It's been clear that there's an absence of good infrastructure to conduct very large pragmatic clinical trials, except with the extraordinary exception of the NIHR in the UK um, and the wonderful results that have emerged rapidly from the recovery trial. And I think there's an opportunity uh, to engage uh, and link with existing clinical trial networks, which have perhaps not been as fully utilized uh, as they could have been. There's an enormous number of clinical trials. Many trials uh, have relatively small sample sizes. Many trials are at risk of non-completion. And I think there's been um, substantial challenges associated with achieving leadership and coordination in the clinical trial space. And I think it's extremely hard for any groups that are doing trials um, to have a role with respect to leadership, facilitation and coordination, because whether or not it's correct, they are perceived as having a potential conflict of interest because of their own trial. I think we really need to take this COVID-19 opportunity to think about pathways for linkage of data in real time. I'm aware of efforts that have talked about um, allowing coordination between data safety and monitoring boards, and that's a wonderful idea, but I think there are limitations with respect to being able to share more than qualitative um, uh, conclusions. And I'd like to think that we can move to something which is much more ambitious, which relates to linkage of the unblinded statisticians um, uh, amongst different clinical trials with an agreed predefined uh, analysis framework. And just as there's been a plethora of clinical trials, there's similarly a plethora of different trial endpoints and important to try and achieve standardization to allow uh, sharing of data. I'm a clinician who goes to work to try and save lives, and this is a disease with high lethality. My personal view is that mortality reduction is the clinically relevant endpoint, not uh, seeking to undermine the importance of reduced duration or uh, of symptoms or stage of progression, but, in the, uh, but would hold the view that these uh, represent biological activity. So I'll speak briefly about what I believe is the ideal type of trial design for a pandemic, which is a Bayesian adaptive platform trial. It's multifactorial, so there's efficiency created by testing multiple questions in the same patient, but it's also essential for understanding the impact of combinations of therapy, identifying non-synergistic combinations versus synergistic uh, combinations. I think it's essential to have stratification by illness severity state. In a Bayesian design, they're not necessarily independent. They can be uh, allowed to exist with borrowing between uh, illness severity states to the extent that is appropriate from the data. They also facilitate frequent interim analyses, which avoids the problem of having to preset a sample size um, sample size in a Bayesian adaptive trial is always Goldilocks, it's always uh, the right uh, size. And of course, because of the availability of multiple treatments within the same platform, the capacity to identify contingent relationships and heading towards the optimal combination of treatments, which is what the information that clinicians uh, need. Next slide, thank you. So remap cap um, uh, uh, was a pre-existing community acquired pneumonia trial. It was able to automatically start enrolling patients with COVID-19 utilizing questions related to two pre-existing domains, those of corticosteroids and macrolides. Since then, uh, we've added an antiviral domain, immune modulation, anticoagulation, convalescent plasma and vitamin C with statins and ventilatory strategy submitted in some locations for approval and multiple additional domains still 
under construction. We've gone from 52 sites in 14 countries to 242 sites in 18 countries, um, mainly by utilising existing ICU research networks. Um, we're in the process of adding India, Pakistan, Nepal, and possibly Singapore uh, and Japan. Uh, we can move to the next uh, slide, uh, thank you. It's clearly good uh, to be international, but I think we've spent some time and effort chasing disease rather than trying to uh, anticipate uh, where disease is going to go uh, next. With respect to our sites, existing clinical trial or at least registry experience has been absolutely uh, critical to effectiveness. We've had major delays as a consequence of the legal issues associated with sponsor sponsor as well as sponsor site uh, contracts. Um, and REMAPCAP is an extremely complex trial and that complexity has been well managed at the site level, but we've been far too slow and insufficiently nimble at a central level in generating new domains and having data management in place uh, to analyse results quickly, as well as uh, set up uh, new domains. So on the last slide, I'll just acknowledge um, the sponsors uh, across the, um, uh, the top row there. Uh, as well as um, an incomplete, uh, unfortunately, list of the um, funding bodies in multiple different locations. Um, thank you, Glenda, for the opportunity to uh, um, speak this evening. Thank you very much, Lynn. Glad, glad we found you. Um, we're going to ask, um, we're, going to do, we're going to talk about um, convalescence theorem um, now, and we're going to ask um, Professor Amin Subandrio to, um, to uh, take us through this. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, good uh, evening and good morning. Uh, yeah, depend. Okay, good evening. Um, okay. First of all, uh, I would like to uh, thank the organizing uh, committee, the Colopit R, for inviting me and giving uh, us uh, opportunity to share with uh, you, all of you, uh, about our act one of the activities uh, related to the treatment of uh, COVID-19 patient. Um, one of the, the approach uh, that uh, has been uh, developed uh, since the last two or three months is the use of uh, convalescent plasma from a recovered patient. So uh, we have already done some preliminary study uh, in collaboration with uh, a National Referral Army Hospital and also uh, a company, Biopharma, and our institute. And uh, we have uh, already uh, recruited um, some donors and also uh, already 10 patients have been uh, treated in the hospital uh, so far. Uh, what we could uh, share with you, uh, eight or seven, actually seven patients uh, has very good uh, clinical outcome, but unfortunately three of them uh, died because of the, uh, the clinical stage is already uh, very uh, late, very uh, advanced. So uh, actually they should not be included in this uh, uh, study. Uh, the, the next study, actually, uh, we have already uh, obtained uh, ethical clearance from the National uh, Ethic, uh, Health Ethic uh, Research. And also, we have already uh, discussed with uh, uh, participating hospital to develop uh, a national protocol and also uh, we also has already uh, approached the uh, Indonesian FDA uh, to get uh, their approval of uh, the use of uh, plasma convalescence. And yeah, I personally approached the, the Red Cross to get uh, their full support in uh, convalescent plasma processing. And our institute, because uh, we are uh, currently, uh, we are the only institute uh, that could uh, 
do the PRNT test, yeah, uh, plug reduction distressing test. Uh, so we will test all the samples uh, from donor as well as from the uh, patient. So uh, in brief, uh, uh, if we talk about the uh, component, I mean, from the donor, um, our we, we are targeting to uh, recruit uh, recovered COVID-19 patient, <coughs> which is, uh, we prefer to uh, rec uh, to uh, recruit uh, males because because of the possibility of uh, anti SLA, but uh, if if the recovered patient is a female, so we have to make sure that uh, there is no history of pregnancy. Uh, of course, they should be healthy enough uh, physically and also confirmed by uh, some lab test. And of course, they should be free from coronavirus and also transfusion transmitted infection as, as usual, as a standard for uh, donor blood. And of course, we have to test, uh, we have to make sure that uh, they have uh, high enough uh, titer of anti COVID 19 antibody uh, proven by PRNT. And uh, about the plasma, uh, plasma will be uh, collected by certified uh, blood transfusion unit. Um, by plasma pheresis uh, process, and the uh, Red Cross will make sure the, the plasma that has been collected will be stored and also delivered to the hospital in uh, good condition. And about the patient, patient recruitment, of course, uh, we rely on the uh, doctors who treat the patient in its hospital, so they should uh, fulfill uh, some criteria, including the indi indication of the treatment. Uh, and also, they have to uh, set up the doses and the uh, uh, frequency of uh, administration. And of course, they have to monitor and evaluate uh, the patient condition and uh, report to the team. So uh, um, our institute uh, has been assigned by the Minister of uh, Health and Minister of uh, Research and Technology to lead a, a national consortium for uh, convalescent plasma treatment. And next slide, please. Uh, I can I could share with you some progress so far. Uh, we have already obtained uh, approval from uh, Indonesian FDA and uh, they have already provided us with uh, guidelines, national guidelines. And also uh, the uh, member of uh, consortium has already established a national protocol for uh, convalescent plasma treatment of, of COVID-19 patient. And also, uh, uh, we at Eggman Institute has already have already been developing the uh, COVID-19 PRNT procedure, yeah. and this clinical trial has been registered uh, at the Clinical Trial Gov uh, PRS or Protocol Registration and Results System. With uh, the we receive already the protocol, protocol ID as written in this uh, slide. Next. Yeah, I think that's uh, I could share with you. Um, yeah, uh, I'm ready to entertain some question from the audience. Thank you very much. Check the um, check the box, the Q and A box for questions, um, and then because um, we, we're running behind time, so um, if you can just check the box uh, and um, answer in the box, I'm going to ask. Um, um, are you ba are you back online? Um, Valdelea, will you, will my, you... My, uh, my video is... Uh, doesn't matter, we can hear like you beautifully. Video. We can hear you beautifully. Yeah, yes. 
Uh, the next presentation will be on safety and, and, and efficacy of SARS-CoV antibody by uh, uh, Professor Bart Hagman from Erasmus University. He is a work group leader at the Department of Viral Science at the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam. Currently, he's involved in the development of serological assays and animal models for SARS-CoV-2, as well as intervention strategy. Yeah, thank you. So next slide. So we continue uh, the work done on uh, SARS-CoV antibodies. I said these can neutralize the virus and that's one of the activities, but it has more activities antibody dependent cytotoxicity, but also unwanted effect, like uh, enhancement of replication. But uh, in most studies, and just what the, the previous speaker indicated is that, for example, plasma is used based on neutralization in vitro directly in clinical trials. So the next slide, uh, I present data uh, of a study done in the Netherlands led by Bart Reinders here at EMC and now online in a preprint. Uh, and that is a randomized trial uh, uh, with uh, 86 patients and then receiving either 300 mil of plasma with uh, antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 or the uh, standard care of uh, treatment. So, and it, uh, the, the, the outcome was the mortality, but also um, uh, hospital stay and uh, disease severity. Uh, to make a long story short is, is that when we look at the outcome, we didn't find any difference in mortality, hospital stay, or a uh, disease of uh, severity. So this is a, a larger study with a control arm. So it is important to look at, at all the variables. So next slide. When we looked at the <clears throat> neutralizing titers, both in patients as well as in donors, it was remarkable that, and that's on the right, that if you look at patients at the time they are taken up in the hospital, they already have antibodies to the, to the virus. And this is in varying amounts, so it can be high or low, but there's also a considerable group that has already very high levels of antibodies at the start of treatment. The other aspect is that if you look at the donors, there's quite some variability. And the overall mean titers actually are the same in donors and patients. So we selected only those with high neutralizing capacity and that's shown in the middle. Next slide. And that is consistent if you look also in <clears throat> larger cohorts and uh, zero conversion that's shown on the left. So the red dots indicate uh, uh, patients with more severe disease. And you can see that already seven to 14 days after disease onset, you find neutralizing antibodies. So this is probably not good if you start treatment at that point, whereas the ones that have a milder disease in green take longer to develop antibodies. And that's shown on the right. So there are two potential problems in that starting and the treatment in patients which already have antibodies and you derive the antibodies from donors which have a less severe disease. So they are asymptomatic to mild, and those have lower levels of antibodies. So these, you need to take care in designing this, this, this study. So next slide. So we also wanted to get more insight in the mechanism of action of the, of the, of the plasma and could find more correlates of protection. I said in vitro you have assays, but we also focus on other assays in this uh, uh, study that is also funded by the Netherlands Organization for Health and Research to see also preclinical models to support the antiviral activity. And that's similar to what has been done actually for uh, hydrochloroquine that you directly go into patients. So in this case, we also go back to, to preclinical models. Next slide. And then in this case is hamsters. So we took actually plasma from those patients with very high levels of, of, of antibodies. So in this case, more than 1,000. Uh, titer PRNT50. So this is really the top of the ones we got from the donors. Uh, that was used at 500 microliters IP. So that dilutes out similar as the 300 ml in humans. So one in 10, one in 20 dilution out. They also used a lower dose of plasma. So one in 10 dilution IP injection and then 24 hours 
after the administration, the animals are challenged. Next slide. So basically what you see is that in blue and on the, on the left, it's the, uh, uh, the change in body weight. And you can see that in green control animals gain body weight and that animals treated with the plasma with high dose of antibodies, actually blue, dark blue, they uh, increase body weight. So they are protected against low respiratory tract disease. Whereas the, the animals receive lower dose of antibodies and control plasma, lost body weight and show disease. They also have infiltration in the lungs. So if you look into the lungs at day four on the right, you can see well, titers are lower in the ones that are treated with a high dose of, of plasma. But already a one in two, one in 10 dilution uh, uh, dilutes out the antiviral effect and also the protective effect. So we didn't have any evidence for antibody dependent enhancement. Next slide. So to conclude is, is that what we see is that timing of the administration is critical and also the dosing. So you really have to select high dose, high <clears throat> uh, neutralizing titers and already then you have to account for one in 10 dilution in patients. So reaching, especially have lower levels of, of antibodies, uh, uh, reaching a level that could not protect based on the neutralizing capacity of, of these antibodies. Uh, so this could be increased, of course, by purifying the plasma, increasing, but also, of course, recombinant monoclonal antibodies. We already have data that that indeed has uh, higher efficacy also in hamsters and hopefully also in humans. And the data obtained should be uh, come together in a meta-analysis for analyzing the subgroups. And with that, I can hand over to the, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, um, can we move on to our next speaker? Um, and that will be um, 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 sorry, uh, Keith, uh, uh, Dr. Keith Hoots from the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute of the US. Um, and just to ask Steve Webb, just to look at some of the questions that's been asked about trial design in the box, if you could just answer some of those for us. Thanks. Thank you, Keith Hoots. We can't hear you, Keith. I thought I, uh, thank you very much. Thank and you. I'll commence. I think I, I did try to unmute, but now I'm unmuted. So uh, I, I'm going to briefly present uh, three platform trials that are part of the NIH active program. Uh, I'll summarize exactly what I'm going to say first and then give you a slight bit more detail in the very limited time that I have. Uh, we are essentially doing three platform anticoagulation protocols that are adaptive in design. All three uh, will utilize Bayesian analyses as we've heard previously discussed and I will not uh, discuss those statistical issues uh, in, for lack of time. Um, the initial trial, which is the second bullet on the, on the slide you have in front of you, is the in, inpatient trial. Uh, it is an amalgamation of a number of trials that have come from around the world and will begin with two standard arms, uh, therapeutic doses of unfractionated heparin versus low molecular weight heparin prophylaxis dose. Uh, and uh, it will be powered to um, hopefully see a difference uh, in sick hospital patients uh, up to and including intensive care that will be uh, as an entry criterion based on D-dimers. The second trial that will be inaugurated, the inpatient trial will be inaugurated very imminently uh, and will take place in, uh, across a number of countries uh, besides the United States, including Canada, Spain, and Brazil, uh, as will be true for the other two trials as well. The second trial, which will, be, will follow on in very short week or two, hopefully, uh, is also adaptive design study, but this one is uh, a prophylaxis study using uh, anticoagulations versus initially aspirin as an antiplatelet agent versus placebo. And I'll give you a little more detail about that in a second. And the third trial, which should hopefully uh, initiate in early August 2020, is an adaptive design study to investigate effectiveness of anticoagulation and or antiplatelets in post-hospital uh, 
COVID-19 patients uh, to try to pre prevent downstream uh, DVTs, strokes, MIs, et cetera. One of the things that makes this particular uh, set of platforms, I think, exciting is that we have in place a central biorepository, as do many trials around the world, but we also have a component for mechanistic studies to look at endothelial crosstalk with circulating uh, inflammatory cells in, in vivo and then use and also with procoagulants and, and serine protease inhibitors to try to design next iterations of interventions. Next slide, please. So let me give you a little more detail. Uh, for the inpatient trial, uh, it's initially focused on low, as I said, versus high uh, therapeutic unfractionated heparin. Uh, it will enroll patients more than 18 years of age, hospitalized with a diagnosis of COVID-19. Uh, they will be required to have an elevated D-dimer at, uh, at enrollment and randomization. Uh, and um, that will be defined as twice the upper limits of normal by individual laboratories, uh, because this will be done in what's known as a network of networks, which will be uh, probably somewhere around 12 to 15 distinct networks around the world. Uh, the act, this master protocol is intended to evolve adaptively, as I said, as the data emerge, and uh, we're already beginning to explore possible next iterations once the uh, uh, adaptive uh, endpoints, and they'll be looking at, so this will be a thousand subjects per arm, and we'll be looking at results under the adaptive design protocol every 200 enrollees in each arm, or placebo and uh, the therapeutic arm. The safety endpoints are obviously major bleeding as defined by the International Society of Thrombosis and he Hemostasis. And the primary endpoint is the days that the patient receives organ support defined by the World Health Organization six through nine. And obviously death is the worst outcome. Next slide. The outpatient or the second one to enter, uh, to enroll patients, uh, hopefully in a matter of weeks, is a multi-center adaptive randomized placebo controlled platform trial evaluating safety and efficacy of antithrombotic strategies in COVID adults not requiring hospital admission at the time. So these will be uh, individuals who are assessed in an emergency uh, setting for a possible COVID infection and at least a modest symptom at the time. Uh, this will all be done uh, using uh, digital platforms uh, to reduce uh, exposure of healthcare uh, professionals to uh, the patient and vice versa. Uh, and the composite endpoint or primary outcome is uh, need for hospitalization for cardiovascular or pulmonary indications. Uh, and these can include death, obviously cardiac arrest, symptomatic deep venous thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, arterial thromboembolism, um, MI or stroke, and up to 45 days after enrollment. Uh, they will be randomized in a double blind uh, placebo control forearm adaptive platform trial with the stage one randomization to include aspirin as the antiplatelet first arm uh, versus a prophylactic dose of apixaban, the direct oral anti uh, coagulant at 2.5 milligrams POBID or randomized to a therapeutic dose of apixaban at 5 milligrams POBID. And obviously, as in all adaptive uh, designs, arms may be dropped for futility, safety, or adaptively combined as appropriate. This one will uh, is anticipated to require 7,000 outpatients evenly distributed across the initial uh, four arms. Next slide, please. Next slide. The, the last, oh, sorry, back one, please. The last trial is the convalescent trial. Uh, the in intent here is to investigate the effectiveness of anticoagulation or antiplatelet prophylaxis in reducing thrombotic events in patients after they've been hospitalized for moderate or severe COVID. It's also adaptive. It's a two-arm study initially with an anti anticoagulant. This is a pragmatic design, so any prophylactic dose of low molecular weight or direct oral anti uh, coagulants can be utilized versus a placebo arm where they get neither. Uh, the target population is all hospitalized COVID adults who have not, uh, who did not require therapeutic anticoagulation 
after at the very end of their hospitalization. It, obviously, they could have been on anticoagulation up until that point. The primary outcome at day 45 post-discharge is a composite of venous arterial thrombotic complications, including MI, ischemic stroke, mesenteric arterial thrombosis, and all-cause deaths. And the sample size for this uh, adaptive design is 4,000 patients. Uh, that concludes my pre presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Valdelea? Yeah, I, I can't. Uh, I'm not allowed to start my video. We can hear you. Okay, yes. Uh, our next presentation will be on approach for pre and post exposure prophylaxis. It will uh, be presented by Professor Sir Nicholas John White. Uh, he is professor of tropical medicine at the Faculty of Tropical Medicine, Mehdal University, Thailand, and at Oxford University, UK. Professor uh, White is a Wellcome Trust Principal Research Fellow who chairs the Wellcome Trust Tropical Medicine Research Program. Uh, please, Dr. Uh, uh, Nicholas. Thank you very much. So uh, a change of tack now. This is, uh, I'm a clinician who lives and works in Southeast Asia, and I'm trying to run a large pre-exposure prophylaxis trial. But first, some background. From a perspective of low resource settings, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis or post-exposure prophylaxis has to be simple, safe, well-tolerated, affordable, and deployable. And we haven't got the drug. Uh, in fact, no new uh, chemical entity is likely to become generally available at least within a year. And as you probably all know, there has been intense politicization of the lead candidate, which is hydroxychloroquine. Uh, so much so that it may in fact become impossible to ever find out whether this drug could be of benefit in pre-exposure prophylaxis. I think a paradigm is becoming increasingly clear that uh, inflammatory processes and secondary processes such as coagulopathy are very important in the hospitalized patient, but viral burdens peak relatively early in the evolution within the individual of COVID-19. So uh, for an intervention to uh, an antiviral, direct acting antiviral intervention to work, it's got its best chance the earlier if you are in the evolution of the infection. It's been a very difficult milieu to work in. There have been exaggerated claims and counterclaims about, uh, particularly about hydroxychloroquine. There has been overregulation, overreaction, I apologize, from the regulatory agencies, uh, stopping trials, uh, making premature judgments, and there have been unclear messages from governments and international uh, organizations. Uh, whilst all this is happening, in fact, countries are recommending uh, hydroxychloroquine, sometimes chloroquine without evidence. In fact, 20% of the world's population live in countries where hydroxychloroquine is recommended now for pre-exposure prophylaxis in healthcare workers. There are a number of other alternatives, uh, the repurposable alternatives, uh, probably lopinavir, in the lead, but nitrosoxanide, miglostat, a Gauss's drug, zinc and several others, but most of the uh, research has been on chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. Despite uh, all the uh, interest and uh, the fact that there's been no other thing in the news for the last six months, the bureaucracy and the process obstacles to conducting trials are probably worse during COVID-19 than they are normally. Not uh, accelerated review, accelerated approval are, is rare. The majority of research has been conducted in richer countries, but these are the countries which have been most affected. And as Steve Webb has pointed out, there are a very, very large number of small trials, all of them, or nearly all of them, underpowered and destined not to provide definitive results, and very few large trials. Next slide, please. So in terms of efficacy, judgment, the judgment has been made that uh, this is the US FDA's judgment that hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine don't work because they definitely don't work 
uh, as demonstrated by the recovery trial, you see the survival curves for solidarity, which is still in progress, the WHO's trial and, and recovery, and they show a slight harm, in fact, associated with hydroxychloroquine, very slight. No divergence of in the mortality curves around at the, at the onset when the loading dose would be given, none around day 10 when you would expect peak concentrations. So reassuring from safety, but clearly doesn't work in the treatment of the hospitalized patient. There are few data uh, on post-exposure prophylaxis. David Bowari's study from, in the New England Journal is the most widely quoted. Uh, it's reported as a, a negative trial, but actually in people who got um, the drug within three days of exposure, there's a th approximately 30% uh, benefit. Of course, it's not statistically significant, but to say that this, show, this uh, relatively small trial means that the drug doesn't work, I think is a little bit of a stretch. There's a paper out in CID today, even smaller. So most of the trials have looked for large differences. They're not powered to look at small, but potentially important differences. Next slide, please. Safety, I think also we have seen um, some exaggerated statements. It's commonly quoted that there, is in, there are increasing reports of cardiovascular toxicity. There are certainly increasing reports, but they all say the same thing, and that is that uh, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine prolong the QT interval. It's undoubtedly worsened by the co-administration of macrolide azithromycin, but there is no evidence from the trials to date, in fact, increasing evidence against toxicity and for safety. That, uh, those are the ventricular arrhythmia in the, uh, in the numbers shown there, are those from the recovery trial. And there have been some rather strange statements uh, that uh, chloroquine, for example, produces hemolytic toxicity, whereas we have 60 years of usage in malaria when we know that's not true. So all this has clouded the uh, issue. Next slide, please. So what we're doing is uh, trying hard to uh, conduct a very large uh, placebo-controlled double-blind trial in healthcare workers to see whether we could detect a, uh, it's powered for a 23% reduction uh, for both for the drugs individually, so pooled obviously it would be more powerful uh, to detect a 23% reduction with, from a, with a 3% infection rate. So a small benefit, but potential, but at scale, a useful one. And the, uh, this trial was uh, started in April. It was just about to start in the UK on May the 22nd. And on, uh, in fact, uh, about 20 patients had been recruited when the Lancet paper from Mera et al. came out, which uh, claimed that chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine caused ventricular arrhythmias and an increased mortality. And immediately the regulatory authority stopped the trial. And as you all know, that uh, paper in the Lancet was almost certainly based on fabricated data and was subsequently retracted, but the regulatory authorities did not retract their ban for another six weeks. And so that's the context in which we're trying to uh, conduct this trial. It's very, very difficult. And my one question is how can the large randomized control trials that we need to provide definitive evidence and for which we have only one so far which has provided actionable evidence, actionable evidence that's recovery, how can these be promoted and how can they be protected? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can, we, can we move on to the next speaker? Um, and this will be Philippe, um, from, uh, Philippe Dunton from um, Unitaid. He's talking about the Unitaid's contribution to the global 19, COVID-19 global response. Thanks very much. Thank you for having me and I hope you can see me good. Um, at least uh, hear me good. We can. Thank you. Um, yes, and apologize uh, because due to conflicting agenda, I, I will not be able to, to stay too long after the presentation, but of course I can uh, answer the question if any after. Um, so maybe uh, not a, a lot of you don't know UNITED. UNITED is an organization, it's partnership of WHO, uh, very active. Uh, of course, in HIV, AIDS, and uh, malaria, TB, uh, women health, and child health. And uh, 
our specific mission is to connect the upstream and the downstream, to connect the needs in the countries, uh, and of course, the work that academics, uh, pharmaceutical industry, PDPs are doing. So it's to bridge the innovation, but also with a specific angle, with um, access, a principle uh, in terms of reducing the reducing the, the price of the, the goods, uh, make sure that we have, uh, of course, the, um, the, the, the formulation adapted for children or for a specific group, and also, of course, to, to make sure that it's a quality uh, ensured. So that's, ne next slide, please. That's the reason why we have been uh, asked to join the ACT. And uh, there is a lot of maybe mystery about it. ACT is an initiative with convening, in fact, several organizations to address the needs, uh, in particular for the LMIC, to um, uh, benefit from the research and the potential new tools. We all know that uh, new tools, by definition, are needed to fight this pandemia. Uh, we know that uh, it, it's needed to have a, a vaccine, but also to have a, a therapeutic that works. And thanks for the presentation this afternoon. It's very useful. And of course, a diagnostic. So uh, the question, as you know, is that the, with the current environment, all the countries in the world want, want the same product as soon as we have some kind of readout of the efficacy and the safety profile. And something that we have seen over the last uh, uh, three months. So the architecture is in fact, there is uh, a group of donors with a, a commission, European Commission and other countries that is in fact under construction. We have, all, uh, we have uh, in fact uh, eight weeks of uh, functioning. So we are defining uh, the intervention, the structuration and, and the work. So we have a, a partnership on vaccine with uh, CEPI and Gavi. We have a, a partnership uh, on therapeutic led by a Wellcome Trust and uh, UNITED with others, where the, the, you can see the, the names. And also we have a, a diagnostic partnership led by Fine and Global Fund, where also UNITED is uh, engaged uh, on the market uh, preparedness. Uh, we have also, uh, of course, uh, uh, health system connector, which try to link the uh, advance uh, we can have in innovation to the to the health system. Next slide. So, how the therapeutics uh, is uh, organized? Maybe just to say that uh, we had uh, we have uh, two pledges uh, to fund this uh, act mechanism, which is uh, supposed to be organized for. 18 months, let's see. Uh, but it's, there is no uh, additional structure. There is a coordination, but there is no um, specific entity organization that was set and was, uh, it was a key principle that it has to be uh, flexible and not create another organization. So um, currently the, the level of pledge is uh, around 15 billion, but uh, there is a, of course, different type of pledge in terms of loans, in terms of, so very few are grants and it's uh, currently a challenge to have a, a, a clear read on what is the resource available to do the work. I think that I want to like that. So there are, uh, for the therapeutic uh, partnership, uh, three work stream plus one. Um, the first one, so uh, to look at rapid evidence has been built around the work that uh, the Bill and Melia Gates Foundation was doing with Welcome Trust and MasterCard on the therapeutic accelerator. So it was before the creation of ACT. Uh, and this group is led by Gates and Welcome with uh, interaction with us and GEIT uh, and others. And one of the key elements is to uh, look at all the clinical trials. There are some of them which are directly supported by the accelerator, but of course, it's to detect the outcome and, uh, of the trials and uh, to see what kind of additional support can be provided is a gap is 
uh, identify. Um, the second is the market preparedness. So of course, is to think about uh, as as soon as we see uh, something that is good enough to to look at how uh, we can increase access uh, in particular in, in mid-income countries. So that was the case we had with dexamethasone and in anticipation of guidelines that uh, will be issued, we understand by the British show uh, on Monday and finalized next week, uh, we had taken action with UNICEF to secure uh, some stocks to make sure that, of course, people will access uh, and not be uh, without any stock out. So that's the kind of action we can take. Uh, adequate deployment of countries, uh, of course, it will be with the Global Fund and UNICEF. So it's also the question of allocation, which is a key element. And we have seen, of course, with the dexamethasone again, that the condition of use uh, for access to oxygen is also a key element. Um, we had also the, the a group that we lead on in terms of what are the needs uh, and the funding. Uh, and we are, uh, of course, revising this uh, on a regular basis to take into consideration the evolution of the pandemic and, uh, uh, and, and also the kind of uh, drugs and diagnostic that we have. So this is economy. I think one of the key elements, just to reinforce uh, what was said before, is the fact that uh, I would say not uh, some uh, clinical trials, but we, what we see from the review of the work stream one is the fact that most of the clinical trials uh, will lack of the power or the design to be uh, conclusive, which is unfortunate. And we believe that it's between five and seven percent of the uh, clinical trials worldwide that uh, will contribute to, in fact, uh, make the evidence for what is working. Next slide. So, I mean, it's not exhaustive. Uh, it's just a, a busy slide to maybe look at on, on the left about the, the, the type of compound. And of course, we have, uh, in fact, uh, two types of compounds, the old drug that potentially could be repurposed and also uh, new drugs and also biologic versus uh, small molecules. So if you look at that kind of um, uh, classification, I didn't put a slide on the use cases, but I think that it was quite clear. And I will uh, just reinforce uh, what uh, Dr. White was saying about so there are two types of events in this disease we know very well. There's uh, something linked with the virus. And of course, at the second stage, there is uh, uh, immuno uh, dysfunction. So uh, with the kind of mindset and review uh, that uh, you have a, an idea of what is going on. Uh, of course, uh, I will not um, comment in all the details of this slide because you know, but you can have access to that. Um, the, one of the key uh, elements to, to think is currently, um, we know that uh, there is a potential for uh, antibodies, monoclonal antibodies that are uh, quite uh, very soon, uh, we will see uh, outcome and readouts. We are expecting to have that quite rapidly, as uh, well as the, the plasma and uh, also uh, hyperimmunoglobulin. Uh, that's the, the part of the biological that we know. And of course, the question in terms of criteria, and I think I will highlight also the previous presenter who make the point in terms of what is the uh, ultimate uh, goal, uh, of course, depends on the use cases for sure, but uh, reduction of mortality is something that for us is key to consider to support uh, access to a drug. Uh, on the other side, you have the, anti, uh, the antivirals and uh, potentially uh, there are new drugs that uh, will come, but also still a potential to look at repurposed drugs. Um, we know, for example, that unfortunately it was mentioned in the presentation that uh, we uh, have not uh, been uh, very successful so far in the clinical trials for hydroxychloroquine, so for lopinavir, ritonavir, or flopinavir. Uh, 
uh, but uh, we may have uh, also to look at uh, some compounds like the DAA uh, that are used for hepatitis C uh, that uh, has shown some uh, elements, but still, of course, need to be tested in clinical trials. Just to mention that um, as an organization, we have closed relationship with South Africa, of course, and we are supporting uh, intervention to uh, um, push clinical trials in Africa and Latin America and very close relation also with PEO Cruz, uh, where we work on the AIDS and potentially we may support uh, also things in, um, in the, the COVID response. So next slide, I think we're done. Thank you. Sorry, it was a lot of information in a very short time. I can say, stay with you a couple of minutes, but I have to, unfortunately, to, to get out and have another call. Over Thank you me. very much, Philippe. Uh, we really appreciate that. Um, we're gonna, because we're running um, very behind on time, we, we've managed to do a lot of the questions on the Q&A in the box, and we're gonna move right through to the next session, which is a cost-cutting theme, uh, cost-cutting aspects of therapeutic research. And our first person on is gonna be Guy Cochran, who's going to talk about, um, uh, in the research data uh, sharing, um, he's going to talk about pre-clinical and genomic data. Thanks very much, Guy. Thanks, Glenda, and uh, thanks very much for the invitation. So uh, the EMBL, European Bioinformatics Institute, has for many decades provided data services relating to molecular biology. And some six, seven years ago, we had an opportunity to collaborate through the European Compare project uh, that brought us into contact with uh, the Department of Virus Science in the, in the Erasmus Medical Center, the Danish Technical University, and a number of other partners. Um, and so we had, um, as you see here, uh, a, a good head start um, uh, and an ability to deploy a platform uh, that we were able to launch in, in April. So on the next slide. Uh, so the, the European COVID-19 data platform uh, centers upon molecular biology data, bioinformatics data. Um, it is both uh, centralized, where at the top here we see uh, the central components where data are organized into one place. Uh, and then we have uh, distributed data, both from national infrastructures, so from health and public health infrastructures, um, but also from the uh, international uh, research infrastructure. So these on the bottom right are the uh, European research infrastructures dealing with all sorts of different aspects of clinical and other uh, related data. So the, the, the platform is delivered by the European Bioinformatics Institute, by Elixir, which is the European research infrastructure uh, for bioinformatics data. It's a project within the European Open Science Cloud, and we have a number of other uh, institutional, scientific and, and academic partners. Uh, we are generously supported now by five uh, different uh, European projects, Elixir Converge, EOSC Life, and Core Bell on the infrastructure side, and Recoded and Vio on the uh, on the scientific side. So, on the next slide, please. Uh, so, with the with the platform, we aim to uh, make available a diversity of, of data across many different platforms um, with center point molecular biology. Uh, we uh, provide rapid sharing, uh, rapid release of data. Uh, we provide um, various degrees of completeness. So we have everything from raw data through to fully analyzed, interpreted data. Um, and we provide all of this as a platform for researchers to use um, in, 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 in many different ways. We look, we're looking here at the three uh, technical components. Uh, so first we have on the viral sequencing side, uh, we have the SARS-CoV-2 data hubs. So essentially, this is a toolbox that allows people generating viral sequence data to manage their data, to validate, analyze, and interpret, and ultimately share and publish their data. The central component here, uh, or central to this slide, is the Federated European Genome Phenome Archive, which deals with human data. Uh, so this is a federated uh, system that provides security uh, of access, uh, controlled access into human uh, sensitive data sets that are located within national databases, but technically uh, uh, included within a broader federation. Then the final component on the right is the COVID-19 data portal. Now, this is the entry point for probably the majority of people using the system. Uh, this is a way of uh, discovering the integrated whole of all the different data types, navigating across those, and then interacting with them and downloading and so on. So on the next slide, please. 
it's not possible in the time to, to comment on all the various bits of work that are happening around the platform. Uh, so I'm going to choose just five uh, highlights here. Uh, so if you go to the bottom middle to start with, mobilization of MBLEVI data. So one of the early priorities was to make sure that for the data resources we had available to us, uh, we would propagate the data and make these uh, uh, available in a coordinated way through the platform. So we have sequences, we have uh, variation records, we have protein structures, uh, screens of compounds, uh, biochemical pathways, uh, expression studies, and um, scientific literature. Uh, and these numbers, if you check back every, every few days, then these numbers typically grow as well. On the top there, viral data and analysis. So one of the early priorities back in uh, late February, March, uh, was that there was very little uh, notion in the community of sharing raw viral sequence data. There was some sharing of assembled sequences, but not raw data. And really, given that there are different uh, methods at play here, different, different uh, laboratory methods for sequencing and computational methods for analyzing, um, it, it's important that we have um, a systematic way of looking at raw data to process systematically so that one can generate reliable or generate confidence and understand biases in such areas as variation calling. Uh, so understanding the variations within the viral genome are really important in transmission studies in the biology and so on. Uh, so we uh, put a lot of effort into mobilizing uh, the, the data generation community to uh, provide their data to the platform. We've had some success with this. We now have over 30,000 and uh, raw data sets that are available publicly. Uh, you see the plot on the right there. Um, this is uh, significant, but uh, you can just about see on the map those points in red, that's what we've mobilized. So that's 80% or thereabouts of the publicly available raw data has now come through our platform. Um, so it's, it's been impactful, but you can see that there are many countries where we still uh, yet have coverage. And then we have reached already uh, a substantial volume of raw data that we can uh, and are already analyzing, uh, both in terms of assembly, variation calling and phylogenetics. And um, this with uh, a number of partners, including Erasmus again, including the Dutch uh, Public Health Institute, RIVM. And you see on the right there, uh, a couple of the tools, the right hand one from the Danish Technical University that we're deploying um, uh, at the moment. And we will see some, uh, see some uh, public data coming out uh, along these lines. Uh, so on the left hand side, we have um, an important study that we're just beginning to work on in the Netherlands. Uh, so this is really taking that centralized distributed structure, all the components of it and mapping uh, in the Dutch case data onto this. So we have lab data, we have um, clinical uh, epidemiological data with national infrastructure, we have centralized viral data within the data hub system, uh, and then we have international data here in Zurich. Um, uh, bottom left, uh, we have some ongoing work on uh, data standards here looking at serology. So this brings in, uh, for example, collaborators such as Thomas Janisch, who I think, think we'll be talking later, uh, of the Recoded project. And then bottom right, one of the things that we, um, we are actively working on is extending this out so that we have, uh, in addition to the central platform, we have national coordination. Um, uh, and so on the bottom right, you see the Swedish site, which was launched, uh, I think, about a month ago. Um, uh, that is a, a national site that gives access to the national activities in the, in the, in the domain and links then on to, um, on to the central activities. Uh, and it's important, not just in the presentation, but it's, it organizes the various data flows that need to happen. Uh, so on the final slide, it's just to invite you to engage with the system. Um, there are contact details and ways of, of using it uh, all within the, the, the site and the link there. Um, we invite you to explore the data, to submit and link to link your data to the system, to access our support functions and to provide feedback. And I'm afraid I as well won't be able to stay for very long. I'll remain on the chat for a bit, but I'll have to drop out before the end of the meeting. So probably won't make it to the panel. Thank you very much. Our next, next presentation will be on International COVID Database Research Alliance and Workbench. It will be presented by uh, Stephen Kahn, that is uh, Deputy Director of Quantitative Science at, at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The quanti Quantitative Science Group is focused on quantitative analysis to support program strategies for therapeutic projects that the foundation funds. Please, Dr. Steve. Good morning. Thank you very much, Valdoia. 
So I'm here to talk to you about a platform and an alliance. So these are two separate components, uh, but important in terms of their distinction and then how they work together. This is a, an opportunity motivated by the therapeutics accelerator that you heard mentioned before uh, from our, our colleague at Unitaid. And this is a, a funded effort from Mindaru Foundation in Australia, Gates, MasterCard, Welcome, Chan Zuckerberg. And the goal is to actually create an international alliance that can help facilitate the collaboration and combination of data uh, across different projects that are ongoing for treatment of COVID-19. Uh, we just heard a great example from Guy of an initiative that's doing that on the genomic side in the preclinical effort. And what this uh, project is intending to do is to help create a workbench and a space where the fragmented data can actually be operated on and, and collaborated on together. So it's not an attempt to create an Uber repository, but instead actually to, to motivate the ability for collaboration, knock down barriers and walls, and then actually also be able to work with data that needs to maintain protection uh, by a group of folks who have permission to do so. Next slide, please. The key on this is that we're building on the success of existing organizations rather than standing up something new. So Health Data Research UK has been successfully doing this with data in the UK in a non-urgent setting around uh, generalized healthcare, around oncology, and a number of different respiratory diseases. So leveraging their experience and importantly leveraging their trust uh, is a key component of actually having this international uh, alliance. So people who are willing to work together and share and collaborate and then the workbench, which is a facilitatory uh, technology to be able to do that. And one of the things I'll say from my own experience in trying to put these efforts together um, since, you know, working with Globetar at the beginning, uh, is that, that the technology is never the barrier. There's always issues around ontology and making the data get aligned. That's actually very surmountable. What's really the biggest challenge is trust, getting people to collaborate, getting people to cooperate because you're doing it for the right reasons. And an important capability of this is this last bullet, creating an environment that supports reciprocity between data providers and analysts. Uh, we as, a, as funders who work mostly in low and middle income settings have heard time and again from our colleagues in low income settings how they're tired of their data being sucked up by the Northern Hemisphere, interpreted and then printed out for uh, them to understand what to do. So we really wanna create a system that really supports reciprocity, that data can be collected anywhere, used anywhere in an effective and collaborative way. So next slide. So a key component of this is the workbench. The workbench is, is the heart of this initiative that enables things to come together. It allows investigators to discover data, request access to the data, uh, analyze the data, and then gives federated access. So we just heard again from Guy, uh, and previous discussions about the idea of using a federated space. That means that not all the data has to come to the workbench. As long as we know where the data is, it can stay in a local setting and analysis can be sent to the, to the data itself. And that's actually an evolving model in data science that's uh, becoming more populated. The key is that you want people who are motivated to collaborate, that really wanna work together and not replicate or duplicate each other's work. Uh, next, please. So one of the, the, the key components of this is that the governance of this whole effort is built on what's called the five safes, that you have safe people who are trained and accredited and trusted to use the data appropriately, that their projects are rational, that they're, they're relevant for the data that are being used to address the problem, that you can do it in a setting that actually is providing security for the data, that the data can actually be done in a way that the researchers feel that um, is being used effectively, and that the outputs are also reported in a safe manner. The key here is that you have to do this in a balance so that you can be expedient, right? If you actually have to take time to get approvals for everything um, that, that from individuals, that can really be an extension of the efforts to, to be able to slow things down. And so by setting up an infrastructure that then builds trust in the structure and the trust to be able to, to move forward is really key here. Next slide. And now, importantly also, we want to understand what the public is really interested in. So rather than building a, a trustworthy system only for researchers, what does the public need mostly? Uh, many of you may have seen yesterday, Trudy Lang had a very nice uh, one-page summary written in, in Nature about the questions that are being unanswered by us, the research community, in the COVID crisis. Many of them are not necessarily related to therapeutics and effective drugs, but to other systematic effects. And so we want to make sure that this is not just a constrained consortium, but it can answer a, long, a, 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 a number of questions. So next slide, please. And who are we 
uh, seeking to serve. It's actually a broad group of people across the ecosystem. And importantly, this is a, an effort that we're building to outlast COVID-19 as a pandemic. So we would like it to be a sustainable collaborative platform that continues on in the future. Next. And our projects are driven primarily by something called driver projects, where again, questions are put together by groups of researchers and then enabled to be addressed because the platform and the workbench can pull in the appropriate data, can, can arbitrate uh, the agreements to allow people to be able to access that data and then use it effectively to answer questions. And so we're encouraging people to get involved with us to help identify important driver projects and then build together teams that can collaborate in this space. So last slide. So these driver projects will be sourced from the research community, evaluated and prioritized by our advisory committee in terms of uh, any resource constraint. Um, and beyond driver projects, we want to empower the community to be able to identify and, and, and answer key research questions facilitated by the workbench. So please consider the opportunity to come and join us. And this is just a show of some of the partners that are already involved. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Now, Delea, I, I see you're doing the next one as well. Yes. Uh, can I, I, I uh, get my video on? Okay, thank you. Uh, next presentation will be on challenges for data sharing in low resource contexts. Uh, it will be presented by Ronaldo Ismerio Moreira from Frio Cruz, Brazil. Uh, his, uh, Dr. Moreira is uh, Field Clinical Trials Unit Data Management data management group leader at the uh, uh, National Institute of Infectious Disease at Fiocruz, Brazil. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ronaldo, please. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon for everybody. I will talk about challenges to data cherry in a context of developing countries. So data sharing advantage. It's essential to the science use in order to improve the population's health. Publicly funded science will be also publicly available. An, imp an important requisite for open science, making any scientific research more reproducible and transparent. Countries of different social and economic settings can build efforts to answer common research questions. Scientific communities may answer many complex questions in a faster mode together. Generated knowledge can be equally distributed in order to reduce social inequalities. But you ha also have potential problems to minimize some of them, misuse of data, misunderstanding of science data, low quality science, protection of research participants, communities and researchers, and a huge asymmetry among developing countries, institutions responsible for generating data and developed countries that generate knowledge and technology using those data. That means primary producers versus secondary producers. Next slide, please. So here we can see the general open science principles. We have open access, open data, open hardware, citizen science, open educational resources, open peer review, open notebooks, open curation, wonderful ideas and concepts. But two questions, the knowledge is generated for whom? The knowledge generated by analysis of data from developing countries benefits whom? Next slide, please. So I'll talk about developing countries' challenges and difficulties with data sharing. Limited access to research results published in scientific journals. Lack 
of norms and traditions for open data sharing in collaborative research. Governments treating publicly generated or publicly funded research data either as secret or as commercial commodities. Lack of data centers or digital repositories for researchers to submit their data. As not applying the principle of universally to data sharing with developing countries, the aim of reducing inequality cannot be achieved. Collect clinical protocol dat data and store them in international data repositories require very hard operational work which is a time consuming process, but not having the same opportunities and time to analyze the data as developed countries research institutions can do. Our work is consumed to overcome daily barriers to carry out study protocols with quality and collecting data preparing and placing them on platforms takes a lot of our effort. Next slide, please. Analyzing that data, writing papers in a foreign language, considering Brazil, for example, make us take longer time to explore our, our, our own produced data. And the reuse of this data without the need to ask for collaboration makes researchers in developed countries work much faster and use data in more detail than who researchers who actually produce it on developing countries. Data sharing is often made mandatory in order to bid for research funding without the possibility of fair agreements. At Fiocruz, we have an open science policy and it works so that we have platform to store our data. But we understand that there is a very large asymmetry in terms of resource when compared to high income countries. Next, please. Researchers from high income countries in general are the primary authors in published papers in collaboration with researchers from developing countries. It's also not fair that data obtained from the studies conducted in low income countries can be used without the commitment of collaboration to improve skills of researchers and students from those countries. In general, research institutions in low-income countries don't have established data sharing policies, and the study informed consent form rarely specify the condition of data sharing for authorization by the study subject. Acknowledgement of the data source is not enough. For researchers in developing countries, publications in which they appear as primary author have a strong impact. Next, please. So let's build a less unequal world as soon as possible. So far, an utopic dream. And I would like to put a final question for all of us. How can we jointly build a common data sharing policy that allows researchers from high and low income countries to have the same conditions, increasing the autonomy of researchers from low income countries to really analyze the data, the data they produce? Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Um, that was really great and a good, compelling um, um, need to talk about data sharing. So we're going to go on to the next session and so we're going to talk about uh, clinical trials coordination and um, standard of care um, in uh, therapeutic research. And I'm very happy to um, introduce Greg Caligaro, um, who's from uh, UCT and I uh, had the fortune of hearing him talk about his half low nasal oxygen experience. So Greg, it's nice to have you on this um, symposium. Well, thank you very much. And thanks for asking me to speak from the perspective of a lower middle income country in Africa, particularly South Africa, and um, also facing the dual pandemics of HIV and TB, especially in the city of Cape Town, which is where I live and work. So um, the COVID pandemic continues to grow in the African region since it was first detected in Algeria on the 25th of February 2020. And Professor Gray has already given you some background information. But as you can see from this graph um, and in the bar graph in red on the top, South Africa really remains the epicenter of the COVID-19 outbreak in this region. We've got the dubious distinction of being now in the top 10 most affected countries globally. And I think it's quite striking that the cumulative number of cases, which is now well over 300,000, exceeds that for European countries like Germany, Spain, France, or even Turkey. And last week, the WHO African region and South Africa recorded their highest daily case count of 13,000 and 10,000 uh, cases respectively. And similarly, at the same time point, we had our highest daily death toll of 225 and 192. So clearly this is a problem. And I think there's no doubt that we will see an escalation of cases in other densely populated countries in Africa, although testing capacity and underreporting are likely to be major limitations. And um, although I'm, I'm speaking on low middle income countries in general, I think they're very um, specific concerns, particularly in Africa, with our already fragile health systems and the gross inequalities that exist in some sectors and coupled with the high burden of respiratory diseases that we've seen as a consequence of HIV and TB, as well as diabetes and the densely packed unregulated urban and informal settlements. So, so this all kind of leads to a perfect storm that might increase the vulnerability of this continent to SARS-CoV-2. Next slide, please. So there are obviously challenges on many levels to a coordinated response to COVID, but the question that I've been asked to address today is in the context of clinical trials, what is the standard of care for COVID in hospitalized patients in countries like South Africa, um, which are low middle income country, um, countries? So I've summarized our general uh, treatment response to COVID in the following slide. And uh, as you can see, so if you just um, move one of the animations along, that although we include access to non-invasive and invasive respiratory support in this treatment algorithm, in non-urban settings, and even in some areas of the metropoles of Cape Town or Gauteng, which is the economic hub of the country, um, the two major cities there are Johannesburg and Pretoria, and, and that area on its own is responsible for 10% of the whole of Africa's GDP. But even in those urbanized settings, um, things like ICU beds are severely constrained. And in fact, what we're seeing is that in a majority of secondary level hospitals out of major settings, we have limitations even on the provision of an adequate uh, oxygen supply for patients in hypoxemic respiratory failure. So to address the questions of standard of care, our pharmacological management is fairly limited, but I think confined to agents for which benefit has consistently, consistently been demonstrated. Um, we are limited to intravenous dexamethasone, or the prednisone equivalent for patients with an oxygen requirement. Um, and we do have access to low molecular weight heparin in patients who are on high intensity oxygen or those with an elevated D-dimer. And um, particularly in South Africa, oral dexamethasone is not registered. And so we tended to favor oral prednisone and that's really just to negate the need for intravenous access in patients who are not requiring any other form of intravenous therapy. Um, among our other uh, treatments are proton pump inhibitors for gastric protection in patients who are anticoagulated and on high dose steroids. And of course, we've seen an increase in the number of patients presenting either with new onset diabetes or diabetic ketoacidosis. And insulin is another important drug. And I think it's important to note that there are problems with the cold chain and supply of insulin outside of urban settings, uh, particularly amongst some of our Northern African neighbors. Next slide. 
So um, despite that, I think South Africa is still an attractive place to do um, clinical trials on therapies for COVID. Um, I think our advantages are that we've got extensive clinical trial experience from HIV and TB trials um, and, and quite uh, well um, set up uh, clinical research groups. Um, the major centers have got excellent laboratory infrastructure with capacity for molecular testing, genomics, proteomics, et cetera. Um, and we've got very sound uh, ethical and regulatory authorities to govern the context of uh, the conduct of clinical trials. Uh, next, uh, uh, there are some disadvantages, of course. I think I've already mentioned the testing capacity is limited outside major centers. Um, we have a national uh, shortage of nurses in the clinical um, arena and, and also uh, for, for research assistance. And, and the conduct of clinical trials comes with competing uh, demands for PPE. And so that's something that needs to be supplied independently. Okay, so I, I, thanks for your attention. I'm going to try to stick within the five minute time limit and I'm happy to take any questions in the chat room. Nice Nadia, are you going to introduce the, the next um, person? My, my camera is off. Okay, thank you. The, uh, we, the, the next presentation will be Pandora Value of Investing Regional Preparedness Network. It will be presented by Francine Netumi, uh, the from Congolese Foundation for Medical Research Congo. Francine is uh, chair of the executive director of the Congolese Foundation for Medical Research Republic of Congo. Please, Fran Francine. Okay, thank you very much. And first of all, I would like to thank uh, Glopida for inviting me for doing this uh, presentation on Pandora, which is, which is a preparedness network. So Pandora was created in 2018 uh, after receiving funding from EDCTP, which, is, which stands for the European and Developing Countries Clinical Trial Partnership. And uh, there are four European countries and 10 African countries. And uh, uh, the Pandora is led uh, by the Congolese Foundation for Medical Research here in the Republic of Congo. And 22 institutions are involved in Pandora. So next slide, please. So the mission of uh, Pandora, this network, is to improve capacity in sub-Saharan Africa for preventing and responding to emerging and re-emerging diseases at the human and animal interface. So it's one health uh, network. And yes, next, uh, next slide, please. Yes. So since 2018, we faced many outbreaks in uh, uh, Africa. So we faced the Lassa fever outbreak in Nigeria. And uh, there, the Pandora network conducted epidemiological and uh, interventions in, at the community level. We conducted surveillance study and in close collaboration with the uh, Nigerian CDC. Next slide, please. Next slide. Last year, we we had uh, here in Congo the chikungunya outbreak, and uh, we were highly strongly supported by Italy, which is uh, one of our uh, European uh, partners in Pandora, and also UK, and a partner from Africa, Tanzania. Uh, so we conducted surveillance, entomological, serological, and uh, different investigations. In Nigeria, monkeypox outbreak, where also we, we had surveillance and serological investigations. And as all of you know, Ebola outbreak uh, in DRC, close to here, the Republic of Congo, and all surrounding countries were immediately in a preparedness mode. So meaning Zambia, Uganda, Sudan, Tanzania, Gabon, and Nigeria. We have partner institutions in this country, so we were prepared for in case we have Ebola uh, cases in our different countries. So next slide, please. So now with 
this year, this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So we know that all the countries of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa are affected by this uh, COVID-19 uh, disease. And all of us, we are involved in different ways in diagnostic, conducting different research activities. But what is very interesting with this um, diagnostic is that many of us are doing the diagnosis of the infection from the labs established by EDCTP. So during different previous programs on capacity building. So now really all our countries are show are seeing the the benefit of being supporting through this uh, uh, through EDCTP through this network and really saw the importance to share and to share data, to share activity, to share protocol. So, and for this COVID-19 pandemic, we, we have the support, the local, regional and international support, local support of African Union, the Africa CDC, also, of course, WHO World Health Organization, AFRO, and African Academy of Science, uh, of course, and uh, the Central African Regional Network, CANTAM, and also the East, uh, South, and East, um, uh, West uh, Regional Network of Excellence as well. So, next slide, please. So, to finish the challenges, of course, of uh, such regional uh, network uh, for the preparedness of uh, uh, infectious disease outbreak. So we have many research questions uh, to be addressed. Local transmission with COVID-19, it's not uh, many data are lacking, are missing. We need to work on that. The dynamics of infection, immunity. Uh, many of us are involved in the solidarity uh, investigation led by WHO, so that's very important. And also the necessity to continue to support uh, infrastructure, strengthening of regional and international collaboration. Uh, many of the speakers talk about clinical trials to have more clinical trials in Africa. South Africa is a good place to do clinical trials, but also you think Pandora network or other um, regional network, that's important because the facilities are already there for doing some clinical trials. And of course, on COVID-19, we are ready to be part of any therapeutic or vaccine trial, of course. That's important for us to contribute uh, on this affair on uh, fighting this disease. And of course, to, uh, to finish, financial support is also the nerve of the world. So we need more private, public and private support for doing, uh, for supporting these uh, regional networks. Next slide, please. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Last session, we've got three three more presentations to go, um, and in this in this in this session we'll be talking about the the challenges uh, for um, for um, for for uh, re therapeutic research. And the first um, um, challenges in the first one will be on barriers encountered, and it'll be by Thomas Yange from Heidelberg Institute of Global Health, Germany. Sorry if I pronounced your, your name wrong. Janish, is it Janish? Thomas, are you there? If you're there, you're on mute. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, sorry, I just didn't get myself unmuted. So, hello everybody, thanks for inviting me. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can see your screen. Thank you. Okay, so this presentation is on barriers of multicentric research, and it's going to be the only presentation on barriers, and therefore allow me to make some critical remarks. So this is a situation analysis. It seems that for the most part in this pandemic, the move was to go national and subnational instead of going global. 
This is true for governments, funding agencies, cohorts, trials. There are now many small and heterogeneous cohorts and trials in COVID-19 research all over Europe, but also globally. There seems to be this surreal competition of national entities to win the gold medal of the COVID-19 response Olympics. There seems to have been a disconnect between preclinical and clinical research. We have taken compounds into clinical trials that didn't have the best evidence base from preclinical research. And some of us have asked ourselves where was the common European approach with regard to closure of borders, solidarity, databases, policies, standards for research. This is all going to change, I hope. So some of the major challenges I wanna point out here, and these are the barriers that many of us are struggling with, how to fast track cohort research and trials, how to enhance matching lab capacity at individual sites, unless trials are only done at advanced sites. What is the best way to organize coordination given the competing priorities in terms of critical knowledge gaps versus trials and the competition between countries and research teams? And I am afraid to say now there's also competition between data sharing initiatives. So I'm coordinating the Recoded Consortium that was mentioned by Guy Cochrane. It, uh, is on reconciliation of cohort data for infectious diseases, is a four year program funded by EC Horizon 2020. And we have just got additional funds to, um, or we were tasked to carry out an additional work on COVID-19 data sharing. And the key challenges are those that are being mentioned by you in the previous talks, how to link and store clinical epi data with high dimensional sequencing omics data. And that's actually now being organized with EMBL on the COVID-19 data platform. But even more important or equally important, how to ensure intellectual property and ownership using a portal that is beneficial to knowledge generators, protects the intellectual property, is sustainable and searchable. And I understand with this, we, we overlap quite a bit with what Steve Kern has just um, presented from the Gates Foundation and with other initiatives. So we need, there's a need for coordination now also for, for data sharing. Another example I wanna share with you, this is from a publication that Marion Koopmans uh, sent, sent to me. And, and actually we prepared this prepared this uh, presentation together with Xavier de Lambalari and Marion. At the end of March, still only 45% of the hospital laboratories that were participating in this survey, did uh, only 45% had the task capacity. And the, 40, and the end of March was well into the first wave of the epidemic in Europe. So this doesn't speak for preparedness. So what, what do we need? I think we need an honest assessment of what has not worked well. And of course, also what did work. We, we do need prospective collaboration across national borders. And again, in, in the recorded um, consortium, we are now tasked to retrospectively harmonize for data sharing, which is always a lot more work than doing it prospectively. And it also, of course, requires that people develop trust and share their data, as is well, was already mentioned. We definitely need standards for clinical research and maybe even enforced by the funding agencies. This includes variable dictionaries, documentation, broad informed consent. It includes diagnostic standards, clinical care standards, and data sharing requirements. And I think we can make more use of existing networks and infrastructures to get things moving. And with that, I'm already at the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. And back to you, Glentner. Bye. Uh, uh. The next presentation will be on community and public involvement. It will be presented by Lisa, Lisa Schwartz.
from McMaster University, Canada. Uh, she is the Arnold L. Johnson Chair in Healthcare Ethics at Master University. Please, Lisa. Thank you very much. Um, and I thank you very much for inviting me to participate here today. Um, we're, I'm going to be speaking about good participatory practices in research and wanted to point out that this is a team effort um, from a group that is um, organized through the World Health Organization as a joint initiative with the Research uh, Roadmap on Social Sciences Working Group, the Clinical Working Group, and the Ethics Working Group. Next slide, please. Um, so there's no doubt that uh, our, that good community practices are important, and I think we've just been listening to several presentations where um, a plea has been made for better collaboration and better engagement. Our work is an initiative to demonstrate the importance of good participatory practices and to enable researchers to include community engagement and respectful collaborative practices with communities so that we can support successful research in the end. Next slide, please. Um, we've seen over the years how important this is. Um, we've seen it in various different contexts and to different sorts of extremes. Um, reasons include all sorts of things, including the relevance of the research to the um, individual um, outbreak, but also to the communities involved, uh, the cultural relevance, but also the very practical issues that are part of relevance um, that ensure that the research will be feasible in the long run. Um, it's important for pandemics also, yeah, or in the, in the response to pandemics, for research to make sure that it doesn't hamper emergency public health measures, but actually um, ensures that it's, um, that, it, that it's helpful and can accelerate things. Next slide, please. But even though we've seen so many different uh, positive benefits to community engagement and to good participatory practices, uh, there always seem to be reasons why it just doesn't take place. Um, in COVID, it's been even more of a concern or more difficult, uh, partly because of the speed, the rapidity on which things have, have, um, uh, have taken place. Uh, the fact that this is a new pathogen and it's not even easy to communicate about it with so much uncertainty surrounding it. Um, but very often, too, there's this problem of, uh, you know, we didn't get it started. Is it too late to start it now? Um, uh, the concern about being uh, out of funds when it comes time to engaging with communities because it does cost money. Um, and in this context, again, can it be done on a global scale? Next slide, please. Um, so we have assembled with the task force and with other groups involved uh, some tips and some guidance as well. Um, one of the first things that I have to point out is that planning for participatory engagement is something that has to happen as early as possible. Um, on the one hand, I'm also telling people who sped up the process and accelerated past the point that it's never too late. And I think we can engage and continue to engage with it um, and start at any time. But it is really important to, to do it in the planning. And the funding agencies can help with this by asking questions in the proposals um, and on your application forms about how participatory practice and community engagement is going to take place in the studies. So I would love to see the funding agencies start asking those questions on the forms themselves as part of the preliminaries. How are you going to be involved? It's also really important to budget accordingly because um, as I said, you know, I think we've all been there. Uh, you get started with a study, you're moving forward and sometimes you get to the end of the study or, or you're even at the beginning of the study and you realize, oh my goodness, we haven't got a budget for engaging with the community um, and ensuring that our participation is, is feasible. So, budget for it accordingly, um, make sure that uh, the grant applications include these things. There's also lots of um, existing groups that people can rely on. So don't feel that it's impossible to, um, uh, to pull together in an environment where, it's not where we're social distancing and physical distancing, um, that it seems impossible to be able to pull together relevant groups. But the truth is that there are existing groups. Many groups have worked with them. I know Remap Cap, for example, has a standing um, committee. Um, and these groups can be relied upon and drawn upon to ask for, for example, patient perspectives, um, community perspectives, um, and 
and better engagement with uh, local practitioners and local researchers. This means also that um, being inclusive and being respectful about who the stakeholders are and ensuring as far as possible that all stakeholders and particularly those remote stakeholders who might not have access to care are involved. Um, including also using media, um, finding local experts on the ground who can help out, um, and as I've said, starting early and starting anyway. Next slide. So engaging with communities respectfully is the foundation of good participatory practices. It's empowering, it's resilient, um, and it's going to be the basis for your successful research. Next slide. Um, attached here are some uh, resources that we've already produced. Um, there are two guidebooks and there's, they're growing. Uh, we also welcome and are collecting examples and experiences that you've had that have been successful. So please get in touch if you have the chance. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and our, our next session, and our last talk today, um, as if the COVID-19 epidemic is not bad enough, um, we have um, a, a recorded um, um, by Johan Nates on antivirals for the next epidemic pandemic. Please God, may that never happen. We can start the, um, the recording. And pandemic. Is there something wrong with it? As you know, we have uh, only against a couple of viruses uh, potent antiviral drugs available, and these are herpes viruses, HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and influenza. HIV, for example, can uh, be treated with just one pill a day, and chronic infections with hepatitis C can even be cured in most patients after just 8 to 12 weeks of all oral therapy. So this shows the potential and the potency of antiviral drugs. So against none of the other viruses are antiviral drugs available. And I just list here some of them. We don't have drugs against the pyramyxoviruses, not against the picorina, not bunya, not flavi, not alpha. And it is of course not possible to develop drugs against each single virus, and of course not against viruses that we do not know yet. So for that reason, we need potent pan genus or pan family or even multifamily antiviral drugs to treat infections with known viruses, such as, for example, chikungunya and EV71, but also for epidemic and pandemic preparedness to stop a newly emerging virus at the very beginning of an outbreak, for example, in Wuhan in the first weeks of January, or to treat patients infected with a new emerging virus before a vaccine is available. So just imagine that we would have had today potent pan-coronavirus inhibitors. And that was possible because we knew until December 2019, six coronaviruses that caused disease in man. And we knew from the outbreaks in 2003 and 2012 that coronavirus can do a lot of harm. Fortunately, we have remdesivir, the anti-Ebola compound, that also blocks the polymerase of coronaviruses and favipiravir avihan is having so, has some activity. In my lab, you also have programs on protease inhibitors against coronaviruses, and we have them, these compounds also active against neuro and antiviruses. This shows that it is possible to develop multifamily inhibitors. And then at the right hand side, looking at the replication cycle and the genome of coronaviruses, we know that there must be multiple unexplored targets. We know that may be possible, should be possible, to come up with highly potent and pan-coronavirus inhibitors. Is it then possible to develop drugs against any virus? Yes, of course it is. And I just show you three examples. We developed uh, pan, ultra-potent pan-dengue virus inhibitors that target NS4B, and these are currently in clinical development at Janssen Pharmaceutica. We also developed a class of ultra-potent pan-antivirus compounds that targets the picorina helicase. And we are also developing a class of pan-alpha virus inhibitors that target the capping machinery of alpha viruses. Besides target-based drug discovery, one can also develop uh, antivirals by using phenotypic screens and to optimize the hits towards potential drugs. 
And for this, you need to screen large component libraries and phenotypic assays. This is looking for the needle in the haystack. And to make this possible with highly pathogenic organisms, we built a fully automated lab in a box. So here you do see a view of the uh, of the system. And at the right picture, you see um, the high content images with the blue lid and uh, robotic arms that bring the microtiter plates to all positions. So this works 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so far we could screen 1.1 billion compounds against SARS-CoV-2. We identified promising hits that can now be further optimized together with medicinal chemists. And just imagine that we could have started this exercise 10 years ago. So mankind should be prepared for the expected and expected. We can expect that new viruses will emerge. We don't know which ones. So we need highly potent and safe pan-genius and family or even multifamily antivirals that have preferably a high barrier to resistance. And for pandemic preparedness, this should have passed, have passed at least phase one clinical studies, be stockpiled in a sufficiently high number of doses and allow rapid upscaling of production. Antivirus will be a much needed line of defense against the emerging pathogens, and the cost will only be a fraction of global military spending. To use the words of Peter Piot, there is no time to lose. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to Val de Leo to um, close the session. Um, this has been an amazing um, uh, uh, webinar. Obviously, we need uh, a lot more time. It's a bit ambitious, uh, but I think there, um, it was an, an amazing um, um, overview. And I think that um, some of the questions we can post out, we can send to the presenters and get them to, to answer. And maybe we can put them somewhere on the GLOPED website. But Val Valdelea, I'm going to hand over to you. Yes, uh, this uh, was a great session. Uh, we had a, a, a very rich uh, uh, data presented, initiatives, and uh, I, I believe that all the uh, group, including presenters, organizers, and people that are uh, attending the meeting, uh, is uh, increasing the uh, knowledge and about what is going on and probably new research ideas will come out. Uh, I think that uh, uh, based on what we hear in the session, uh, we have, uh, uh, despite of all our efforts from WHO and other uh, agencies and funders, we still have a long way to go in order to have a better coordination of initiatives, uh, better coordination of uh, uh, harmonization of, of data to be collected and also to uh, uh, avoid so so high fragmentation of small trials uh, uh, overlaps on uh, on trials in and in, in order to increase the use of our uh, resources both financial uh, uh, person personnel, time, and uh, opportunity, we think that we should go for a better uh, coordination among researchers. And uh, I would like to uh, thank you, the uh, organizers, and uh, we thank you also, uh, also all the speakers, and so much for the uh, opportunity to uh, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in, in this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. And we actually finished two minutes early, guys. <laughs> well done. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, yeah, thanks very much, uh, Valdelia and uh, Glenda. I'm going to ask Yazdin to close the session with a few remarks. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. And thanks. So, first of all, I wanted to thank all the speakers. I wanted to thank. Uh, Valdilea and Glenda for your excellent uh, 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 moderation of this session. Uh, thanks a lot for spending with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, um, and uh, I think it, as you, as, as you said, Valdilea, I think that this session was very rich uh, 
extraordinary data, but also it really emphasized on the fact that we have to work together and we have to, uh, to join our efforts regarding uh, the, uh, of course, all the topics, but therapeutics in particular. And this is extremely important over the borders. And I think that Thomas Janisch presentation was extremely important regarding this, really pointing out uh, what are the subjects and what are the outcomes that we need and what are uh, challenges that we are facing. So thanks a lot. Um, I think it was a great session, thanks to you. Uh, we didn't have had time for discussions, but as Glenda said, we should continue to discuss. Uh, and uh, for those you, of you who, uh, uh, who would be present, and I really uh, uh, um, ask you to come on Monday, on Tuesday, and on Thursday, because these webinars are going to continue. On Monday, we will have uh, on transmission with a major issue. And with that, I will close. And I also wanted to really ask uh, uh, all of us to really, we cannot... Uh, uh, clap and say thanks, but really thank you to Charu. Uh, thank you also to, to Claire Madeleine and to Evelyn Ftepater uh, for organizing this uh, session. So from uh, uh, European Commission and from INSEAN. Thanks also to Lisa, to Jason, to, uh, uh, to Abder for, for the technical uh, 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 help on this. And to all the uh, people uh, organizing committee from uh, from the UK, from Welcome Trust, from Oxford, Gale, from Canada. Huge amount of work from Canada. Thanks to all. So, Charu, the floor is yours for the last word. <laughs> uh, thank you, Yasdin. You've said it all. So, thanks, everybody. And I think, uh, you know, the volume of uh, information we heard today is a reflection of how much work there's going on. So, even though we didn't get a chance to do any in-depth discussion, Hopefully everybody benefited from the great geographical representation that the coordinators of the session have put together. Uh, and I see that a lot of the discussion and chat was happening. So I hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you again on Monday. Uh, have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you.